partners to develop capabilities. And so that's really on the, on the, on the leading cutting edge and on, right on the tip of the tongue of Cyber Command and the national security ecosystem. And so I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Eric Rosenberg, who was introduced previously as a moderator. Uh, but just as a reminder, he is one of our superstar civilian attorneys at the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Office, uh, practicing contract fiscal acquisition and tech transfer. Eric, over to you. Thanks, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson. So uh, we're going to introduce our panelists. Uh, so we got um, uh, Mark Montgomery. He's a senior fellow at the uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies. <laughs> Pleasure to have you here. Uh, we have Courtney Majuli. She is the uh, uh, procurement, uh, procurement executive, uh, program executive officer of cyber at US Cyber Command, a part of our J9. And we also have um, Aaron Smith. He is the CISO uh, of Doyon Utilities up in Alaska. So we really appreciate you coming down all the way from there just to speak with us. So the topic of our panel today is innovation in government acquisition and technology transfer. So to kind of before, before we got into that, we're going to talk a bit about fiscal law, right? So it's kind of unique to the government. Uh, for those of you who aren't government attorneys, fiscal law kind of governs uh, the spending of money um, in the government because Congress give, it goes back to the Constitution and power of the purse. Like Congress gives us a certain amount of money and they want it to be spent in a, you know, on certain types of things in a certain time period and up to a certain amount. And they don't want us to exceed the amount which they give us. So there's a certain level of activity that Congress wants us to be doing and not above that. Um, and so that's sort of a key thing. So when we, uh, so they give us this money and they want us to do a certain level of activity. So whenever we get stuff, we need to generally pay for it unless there's a statute that says otherwise. And so through acquisition and technology transfer, these are ways that sometimes we then get things. And so with acquisition, you know, typically through procurement contracts, we, you know, we, we usually spend money to get things. Um, so the definition of procurement contract is when the, uh, the principal purpose of the instrument is to acquire goods or services for the direct benefit or use of the government. And that can be by barter, purchase, um, or lease. Um, technology transfer, the definition of that is different. So technology transfer is basically just the exchange of resources between the DOD and a non-DOD entity. That's the definition you'll find in uh, the DOD 5535.08 on uh, technology transfer. And so it's, it's a bit different. And specifically within technology transfer, we have these agreements called CRADAs. Um, so those are cooperative research and development agreements. And so there's this relationship between acquisition and technology transfer. Uh, so acquisition, most procurement contracts are governed by what's called the, the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And the FAR, uh, you know, most contracts fall under it and, you know, kind of lays out all these rules, um, you know, procedures for how, to, how the government should go about getting goods and services from the private sector. Uh, there's also non-FAR agreements that are part of procurement as well. You have um, other transaction agreements. Um, and a whole host of other uh, ways. There's a, if you go on the, the Defense Acquisition University website, there's a beautiful contracting cone. At least I find it beautiful. Maybe <laughs> for people who are more normal, you don't find it beautiful. But it's a beautiful cone, and it, it lays out all these different ways of working with the private sector through different acquisition vehicles. Now, but with tech transfer, you know, we have CRADAs, and there's a, basically the definition of a CRADA is when we take resources, uh, you know, people, uh, pl um, uh, equipment, facilities, other resources, we pool that with a private sector entity uh, or a non-federal a non entity, and then together we collaboratively research and develop um, consistent with the laboratory's mission, except it can't be a procurement contract. So a procurement contract and a CRADA, they can't be the same thing by definition. Um, court case on this called uh, Chemical Services versus EPA. We won't get into the details of it too much, but the idea generally is that CRADAs are contracts, but they're not FAR contracts. And it's a key thing. So with CRADA, the key thing is the principal purpose has to be R&D, Whereas procurement contracts, the principal purpose is to acquire goods and services. So with creators, we can get to use the, we can leverage the resources of the private sector, their people and their equipment, you know, but you know, we're, uh, it's not the principal purpose of it. Um, so how do you get to use creators and patent license agreements and software license agreements, these various technology transfer authorities that exist? We, you have to be a federal laboratory. And to be a federal laboratory, that's a, a, a facility um, for which uh, there's a, the substantial purpose is the performance of research, development, or engineering by the federal government's employees. So there's sort of this substantial purpose test. So there was a debate about, well, what is the limit of what is a federal laboratory? So there was a court case called Babbitt. And in Babbitt, uh, Yellowstone National Park, they entered into a CRADA with a company. 
and someone didn't like that idea. They're like, no, Yellowstone National Park, that's like for tourism, right? Like, they're not a lab. And that's not what I, I don't really think of a lab when I think of Yellowstone National Park. But, you know, the court said, it doesn't conjure up the traditional image of a laboratory, but there is actual R&D occurring at Yellowstone National Park. Now, it's not the principal purpose of Yellowstone, but it is a substantial purpose. It meets that test. And so the idea is that, you know, well, if Yellowstone National Park's a lab, then Cybercom could be a lab too. And so on October 18th, 2023, General Nakasone designated Cybercom as a laboratory for technology transfer purposes. So that's sort of the touchstone of why we're now engaging in technology transfer agreements is because we are a federal laboratory. Uh, and so, so that's sort of our intro. Now we'll move to Courtney. We want to kind of sort of go over sort of how acquisition works at Cybercom. So I guess how, how does it work? Where do our authorities come from? How do we do what we do? Good afternoon. Is this on? We good? Um, so Cybercom is a combatant command. And uh, combatant commands are operational commands. They don't traditionally do acquisition. The one exception to that before Cybercom was SOCOM. And so uh, SOCOM was a little bit different. They were designated a major force program, which made them service-like without creating a brand new service. And they grew really big, really fast. And Congress went, whoa, that was a lot. Uh, so Cybercom was constructed a little bit differently. In FY16, the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, gave Cybercom limited acquisition authority. We could spend up to $75 million. We were given 10 billets to go and start trying to do acquisition successfully. Uh, we got one program manager, two contracting officers, SJA, legal support. Um, and we said, all right, go try this out, but this is going to sunset in a couple years. This is not forever. We want to see if you can even do this. And the command was successful. And so over a series of subsequent NDAAs, all of those restrictions were lifted. So today there is no ceiling on our acquisition authorities at Cybercom. Um, and we've been growing. So that initial 75 million limitation, um, now that we are unrestricted, in FY23 we did about 750 million. Um, and we're continuing to grow. I think you heard earlier about enhanced budgetary control, which gives the command the decision authority uh, over affordability decisions for cyber across the services and the cyber service components. Um, so we're expanding our ability to acquire cyber goods, cyber services um, for the DOD in an integrated and holistic way. In FY24, I touched on we had those 10 billets initially. We're adding 50 billets this year. So we are staffing up for a right-sized and ready workforce. Um, and it's a pretty exciting place to be. Eric touched on our lab designation. So uh, we are growing into these authorities and starting to execute in more and more rapid and responsive ways. Courtney. And could you go a bit into uh, the joint cyber warfighting architecture uh, known as the JICWA? Can, Eric. Uh, so the FY22 NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, tasked us. And we were told to go stand up a new program executive office for the joint cyber warfighting architecture. What does that mean? Um, the purpose of JICWA is to integrate cyber capability development priorities across the services. So there are um, service cyber components today, and they run their own programs, but we're not integrated and optimized. So that's really the primary purpose. Uh, DOD has 133 cyber mission teams. So this architecture is necessary for integrating the priorities that then deliver for those teams to go execute missions with. DO, uh, excuse me, JICWA is centered on innovation and modernizing technology in the cyber domain. And the cyber domain is really dynamic. So that integration is crucial because things are changing every day and we have to be unified. We bring together the best in breed of all of the different tool capabilities. And most importantly, it's the talent of the people across the services as well. It's inclusive of five parts. We have a comprehensive suite of cyber tools, a unified platform for integrating and analyzing data, joint command and control mechanisms, sensors in support of the defense of our networks, and the persistent cyber training environment, 
which provides training uh, and for mission rehearsal. Great. Um, so I think, uh, let's move on to, to Mark. So how do you view the current state of DOD acquisition and, and how can it be improved? Um, well, that's a pretty open-ended question. I'll just start by saying generally broken. Um, and I'm not talking about in cyber here. I mean, in general, I mean, the Navy just published a list that basically every ship we're building took a one to four year slip and it's taken 10 to 100 percent increase, you know, increases. I could go through the Air Force and the Army and do the same thing. Um, so we have a, a broken acquisition system. I think Secretary Hicks or Deputy Secretary Hicks has made that clear as well. Uh, interestingly, in cyber, it's different. I'll talk about that in a second. But I, I do want to just stick on the fact that it's broken. And and we're and we'll talk a little bit later on about ways to get at it. I think I hope in a question, but I'll start with that. I'll say um, I loved your description. Um, I was part of the congressional staff that wrote most of those incremental things, or when we we're in the Slayer Commission did the same. But I'll tell you, we did we did the wrong thing for the right reason, right? The services are broken in their ability to f g uh, generate forces, and that's not. With recently, I've, at FDD, we've done a paper on the, the personnel part. You can certainly look it up, fdd.org. There's a pretty good paper there on why we need a cyber force. But we really didn't spend as much time as we should have on the acquisition part, which is that the service, the reason we had to do this, and it is, as you pointed out, um, uh, unusual. And the last time we did it, it was a dumpster fire. I mean, we should tell the truth about SOCOM. In the end, we ended up with two two billion dollar submarine submersibles in an Idaho lake of no value to the government. So when we leave a COCOM in charge of, of acquisition, we take risk. That doesn't mean it's not gonna do great at Cyber Command. I'm just telling you, we're one for one on, took a lot of risk. Um, and the lack of, I think you described it perfectly, there's force, the reason we need JICWA is because the forces were not aligned or integrated or developing forces. How can Cyber Command win when you have four, four, four services who aren't fully committed to providing the equipment and the people to, to generate the force structure you need? This isn't a jam on Cyber Command. Cyber Command gets a lot done with the stuff it's given. Not enough, but a lot. Um, so in my mind, that, that's part of that, that brokenness. And I have to be clear here, we're also taking an incredible risk. And we did it knowingly, like Representative Langevin was the number one driver of all this. But we'd sit there and wonder who is gonna be the civilian oversight. Like when a service does something, builds something, they have civilian oversight. That civilian oversight doesn't exist um, in cyber command, in a combatant command, in the same way it exists in a service. So we're, we're taking, and Congress doesn't do good oversight for a lot of reasons. But we have lost our, you know, we are now taking risk by having a combatant commander, we have no other choice. We're gonna keep doing it, because we're at that. But, so when you ask me how we are, we're broken, we're recovering with an incredibly risky plan that's already 0 for 1 in, in execution back in the, in the 2000s. Uh, so I worry, and I'll never say the words, I loved your, I'll never say by the way, I find DFARS beautiful. Uh, I appreciate that you said that, and I'll never begin any sentence with, there's a recent court case. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and learn from you guys at this. But I'm gonna start off by saying, I think we're in a risky place. I think we got ourselves here on our own. I think our services have done no, no good to help Cyber Command on this. And I really hope you're successful in digging us out of this hole. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Courtney, um, so how has Cybercom been innovative in its acquisitions. Apollo. Um, so, to do a slight reattack and then build off with the question, um, I think the command is a really exciting place to be. I started out by talking about how we were given very limited acquisition authority, and uh, I hope that telling you that 10 billets, and by the way, they were not all resourced from the start, um, to where we are today helps amplify the growth that has started to occur. So we started very small. We didn't start to implement until FY17, and we've grown to today. And I think this is very exciting because we've done small scale innovation and we're now poised to grow. And that growth and innovation at the command, I hope, will address some of the concerns that you've touched upon. So um, I'm going to stick a little bit to my script to make sure that everything I say is appropriate for public release. Uh, but if you Google 
DIU, which is the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU Cyber Command Hunt Kits, you'll find their product catalog. Um, and this addresses a really great partnership that we constructed with the DIU organization, FY22. Uh, we took these kits that we had that were already in existence, but they weren't meeting mission need. They were developed for use um, in government networks with security parameters, and they were not forward deployable for the missions that our teams needed to go execute. And so through DIU, um, they're a phenomenal organization that helped us do prototyping. Um, this is fast, so if you're not familiar with prototyping, um, it allows the government to say, listen, we know what our problems are, and we don't know the granular decomposed requirements that normally we would spend a very long time defining, and we don't have that time. We want to allowably produce something that has mission effectiveness, that is of high value and not sitting at the bottom of a lake in Idaho. Um, and, and we partnered with them and we were able to generate um, successful, rapidly prototyped kits, combination of hardware and software, travel friendly for operations at mission partner sites that had demonstrated measurable effectiveness that was superior to the traditional tools and applications available at their sites. So this is a great success story. Um, we've been smaller because the command has had a small posture. That posture is growing. Um, in fact, I believe we're about to be hiring for another agreements officer, tell your friends. Um, but we are committed through what our lab is doing and through our teams of professionals and then through our partnerships with folks like DIU to growing that innovation at the command. Yeah, and just to, you know, to get a touch back on the different types of vehicles, so those were achieved through what are known as other transaction agreement, you know, prototype other transaction agreement, prototype OTAs, and then we've done a follow-on you know, production OTA. So that's, that's the contractual vehicle we're using to, you know, to acquire those, those hunt forward kits. Um, so Courtney, what makes cyber acquisition unique compared to like, let's say buying a tank or, or a submarine? Um, what makes it different? So the cyber domain is different. Um, it's fast, it's rapid. So we don't have the ability to take the time that you would normally put in to building a tank or a fighter jet or you know putting up a satellite is 10 years. We don't have 10 years to wait. Um, we can't afford, you touched on a four or five year slip. In four to five years, anything we're talking about today is going to be obsolete. Um, so that introduces challenges, right? How do we allowably stand up programs that are responsive, uh, but still have some level of oversight and some level of guardrails? And so striking that balance with the right risk acceptance is really crucial. Um, we are doing some exciting things to get after those challenges. So one challenge in DOD, we have what we call the colors of money, which means that money is not just money. I can't just take money I've been allocated and go spend it on the things that I need. I have procurement dollars for procuring things. I have research and development dollars. I have operations and maintenance dollars. And uh, you have to use the right dollars for the right thing because when you mess that up, uh, you have to stop spending that money and go back and, and fix your actions. So, um, we received in an FY19 NDAA and then an FY20 NDAA with additional detail, uh, a little really cool pilot to try spending money like it's money so that when we field a piece of software, okay, should that be O&M? Well, we're going to go back and modernize it. We're going to do some enhancements to it. Ooh, is that RDT and E? I don't know. Okay, let's remove that restriction. Um, this is really fun because it's also aligned to the programming, planning, budgeting, and execution report that came out on modernization and enhancements there. So the command is really at the forefront of looking at how do we need to spend money in a way that supports the forces. Um, another challenge that we have is constructing acquisition strategies that are responsive. Um, so major capability acquisition, that's where we think about traditional acquisition, milestone A, milestone B, very labor intensive, very time intensive, um, very rigorous. And DOD has given us some really great tools in the adaptive acquisition framework. Um, software acquisition pathway and middle tier of acquisition with rapid prototyping are allowable ways to pursue acquisition that have uh, strategies that are more responsive and tailored to the types of acquisitions we're doing. 
And so we're being given flexibilities and tools by Congress that allow us to be faster and more responsive for the type of acquisition we're doing with cyber. Um, let's see. And then you touched on uh, the FAR, and uh, I appreciate your enthusiasm as well. I am enthusiastic about acquisition because it, it allows us to get after needs that we have. But a singular system is really difficult to align to acquisitions, which are not a singular type of acquisition. And with cyber being rapid and needing responsive software um, and, and services in a little bit of a different way, we now have access to systems through some of what you touched on, right? Um, Non-FAR based contracts that allow us to be more responsive as well. So it's a little bit different and we have some challenges and then we have some solutions that we're starting to pursue that are pretty exciting for us. But on one thing on that, I agree completely with Courtney. By the way, I love your idea that it's an exciting place at Cyber Command Acquisition. I believe it probably should be. Risky places are exciting. That's where I would want to go. Um, but on the issue of what's unique here in defense cyber acquisition is that, let's say I was going to build a tank. It isn't like, hey, Southern Company wants to build a tank as well, or, you know, pg and es building a tank. You know, we're usually we're just doing it on our own and we can fiddle fat around and that's how we end up at three to five years. What's really unique in cyber acquisition, particularly in defensive tools, but even to some degree, some of the offensive tools, is somebody else is also, there's a whole marketplace out there in the private sector. And that's both, that's a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is, if I were given advice to, if somebody came to me and said, man, Mark, I've, I broke the code. I have the best tool for anomalous activity detection in the world. My first piece of advice would be, do not go anywhere near DOD or the IC. Run to the private sector and sell your product and make a ton of money. Because if you run to DOD and IC, I won't see you again for 12 to 18 months, and that's being generous. You know, and whereas, you know, we don't want that to be the, the theory. We want, we want DOD and the IC to be seen as the, the first choice, not a, well, I need to go there. And, and so I think in cyber, our, if we want to be on the cutting edge of innovation, if we want entrepreneurs who are out there developing tools to come to the department and come to the intelligence community, then we're going to have to create an environment where they can move at the same speed and pace they can in the private sector. And, and uh, I know your goal is to get there, but I would just say, in general, the Department of Defense has not been the place you go uh, for agility. Thank you, Mark. I mean, I think, you know, we're trying to get that, you know, leveraging these different types of tools. I mean, that's also where the kind of the creative discussion will come in, right? Because sometimes, you know, we buy things and they ultimately don't work. But creatives are a way we can kind of explore the realm of the possible for offensive and defensive cyber capabilities, you know, kind of pre-acquisition and kind of, you know, learn what, what types of capabilities would work for us and what wouldn't. And so I think, you know, together, I think we can, you know, we're going to have more kind of sort of comprehensive planning, like using CRADAs, using OTAs, using CIBRs to try to kind of get at these problems kind of left of like, you know, a uh, big A acquisition. And that way we can kind of reduce uh, costs. And this actually ties into the next question, which uh, I know you're looking forward to, sir, uh, is uh, about the valley of death. So could you kind of explain the valley of death concept and how do we get out of it? So the, val the valley of death, and I think everyone in here probably gets it, but in the, the shorthand is um, the amount of time from when we introduce a product into that R&D phase and end up with a, uh, a product that's at least in the operational test and evaluation and potentially ready to go into low rate initial production. And that, and you know, if you look at a, a Navy ship, that's a 10 to 15 year process. Aircraft are about the same. I think smaller items, you know, uh, handheld items can be, you know, three to five years. But in cyber, as, uh, you know, Courtney's you know, alluded to, you know, we're trying our, we're getting special authorities and we're doing things to try to shorten that process. Part of giving SOCOM acquisition authority was a, you know, uh, the secretary, I think it was, um, might have even been go all the way back to Rumsfeld, I think, who just became extremely frustrated with the answers he got from service acquisition authorities on the new weapons that we were discovering we needed in 2002, 2003, uh, 2004, as we started to enter, you know, significant ground combat. So um, that valley of death is, this, is an excessively long time through which the um, seed funding or initial funding for a company expires before they can get through that R&D or uh, and in the operational test and evaluation. You know, I think this leads to a, a bigger problem for the department, which is that we also, we just, 
we don't take risk right. And I think Deputy Secretary Hicks has talked about this a couple times. Probably, you know, the, um, the kind of early release of the replicator was a reflection of her frustration with the, with the uh, department's inability to take risk in acquisition. What I mean by that is, the, you know, we have a success rate in the department, and I, I say this, you know, kind of humorously, of 99% on our programs, because we just keep throwing money and time at the programs, and eventually they're a success. Now, not in a way that you and I would define success if we ran our personal checkbook, you know, and, you know, we're 10 years behind on the rent, and, you know, and, uh, you know, and the house is half the size we expected, you know, we would be really unhappy. But, you know, the problem we have is we're not willing to take risk. What I would love to see is that if, of 100 products that, that Cyber Command put into the gonculator, to start looking at the R&D level, if 40 to 50 percent failed, in other words, have a high failure rate. But right now, most, I mean, I've worked my way up through the ranks in the Navy. Most of the people in here work their way uh, up through the civilian or, or officer enlisted ranks in the services. You don't get promoted by failure, right? You, there's a sense of zero defect. It really permeates uh, the procurement program. But Mark, program. like, I mean, so, uh I mean, I guess, what do you think of SIBRs, though, and SIDRs? Like, that's small business innovation research. Yeah. That's when uh, the government does make different size bets. You know, like yeah. phase one SIBR, that's a bunch of little bets. And then phase two is slightly, you know, a fewer number of, of bigger bets. And uh, TACFI and STRATFI, what's your sort of take on that? I'm a big fan. And, and I'll go further and say that I think the Office of Strategic Capital is onto something with their bets on, on small business loans. I'll also tell you that the small business loans, the DOD is like an A infinitesimal percentage of the federal governments. So just to be clear, we're not, the DOD isn't near as excited about SIBRs as, the, as we in this room might be, right? I mean, big DOD. They don't bet on, they don't bet, if you go to most PEOs and say, hey, um, I got an idea here, about 70% chance it'll work, but it's gonna take about 40 million for me to get, figure out if that's true or not. You're not gonna, you're out of the room, next guy's in who goes, it's 100% chance I'm gonna succeed, or it's 98 or 99. We want that success rate. Look, look at our number of non-McCurdy breaches. It's like two or three. But you look at the number of programs that are donkeys out there, they've gone way over budget, but we rename them or restart them or do something. We all know the bull, Hucky that the uh, you know the, the department produces to get its way through these this, this, these um, fence posts and milestones and so from my perspective we need to we need to experience a lot more failure, real failure, failure at the front end so that we can get to this and that's where innovation kicks in. If you want to have innovation, you got to have failure. If you go to a venture capital firm, and you ask them what's their failure right, they're going to say seventy percent, right? that they, 70% of the people they put a little money into fail or, or come back at 1x or 2x, right? Uh, not not a, you know, a failure in terms of making money. Right, thank you, Mark. Courtney, do you want to add anything? Um, so I'm a huge champion of empowering our workforce. Um, that's one of my biggest cornerstones. Um, when you touch on failure, I actually really embrace that. That's kind of a, a key principle of prototyping, right? Which is a new, one of the new acquisition pathways I touched on. Um, you don't prototype to go straight into production. You're prototyping to fail fast and cheaply so that when you get to your end thing, uh, you've, you've already gotten the failure out of the way and you're not investing heavy program dollars at that juncture. So how do we do that? How do we create that culture? It's through investments in the workforce. And I'm thrilled with some of the training that is starting to evolve and come out of DAU. Um, there's a credential for other transactions, and there's a lot of classes that are getting us towards things like CRADAs. I'm a huge fan of CRADAs. Uh, you touched on things sitting on the shelf. You know, what we need is not COTS anymore, not commercial on the shelf, because we, again, don't have time. Things are antiquated too fast in the cyber environment. We need CRADAs, not for commercial on the shelf, but to go straight to commercial commercialized innovation that's out there and bringing it in. And again, the way that we do that is through the empowerment of the workforce. And so that is a huge focus in the cyber area because it's not um, a stodgy and antiquated and outdated acquisition model that we want people to come in with. We really want to leverage these tools that we've been given with a workforce that knows how to use them strategically and effectively. I just wish a senior leader, I love what you say, but I wish a senior leader would just stand up and say, you know, I'm a big fan of failure. Because I would believe, if someone said that, we would be actually on the, on the, on the track to success. But I think there's a disconnect at the very senior level between 
their understanding of, of failure rates and prototyping things, and probably you know, at the, at the program executive officer level. I, I do think there's still that disconnect, and I don't think a PEO can have like two or three failures in a row and move on to program number four. Thank you, Mark. So we're gonna pivot a bit now back to tech transfer for a little bit. Um, so uh, so be before I came to Cybercom, I was actually at the 67 Cyberspace Wing. Um, I was their chief of cyber IP law, and I had the pleasure of negotiating with Aaron Smith on uh, what was our second critical infrastructure, second critical infrastructure CRADA. And so what does that mean? So uh, there are different things we do with CRADAs. There's really kind of infinite possibilities. Um, but you know, the, the type that Cybercom is gonna be focusing on is one bucket, like capability development focused CRADAs. Like we just signed a CRADA with University of Missouri, Kansas City. It's gonna focus on UAV enabled cyber ops and AI enabled cyber ops. And you know, really exploring the realm of the possible for offensive cyber. And it's gonna be a great opportunity to partner with academia. Um, the other type of creators we're going to be doing are what we call critical infrastructure creators. That's where we research and develop collaboratively with the partner, uh, you know, potentially on their networks, to develop you know, new TTPs uh, for defending different types of systems. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking often operational technology, industrial control systems. Uh, this is really beneficial to our forces because they often you know, don't, they do not have as much experience with OTICS systems. But if this country were to be attacked, OTICS uh, networks, you know, for the power plant, the water company, these would be, you know, of interest to the adversary. And so it's really important that we get our folks sort of that experience and the relationships with the private sector so we can have this true public-private convergence. So if there was an attack, we could really hit the ground running. We already know that, that power plant near the military base. We already have a crater with them, and, you know, we can save hours, and that could really save lives. Um, so. Uh, the first critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure creator we did at the wing uh, was with a CPS Energy in San Antonio. Uh, but the second one we did was in Doy with, with Doyon Utilities. So, uh, Aaron, could you kind of describe a bit, you know, how you, I guess, why you entered into a creator with the government and how that came about? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Eric, for letting me come up here or over here, really. Um, a couple of days ago, I was fishing on the Naknik, which is a very good chance to go to Alaska and fish. You should absolutely do it. Um, and it took me 24 hours to get to D.C., but it's well worth it. So I just want to say, one, thank you. Um, and two, yeah, no, and two, really, thanks to everybody in this room. You know, um, I'm not, maybe not as lively as the discussion that's happening over here, but it's after lunch. Um, but just everybody in this room really helps support what we do. If we didn't have the, the government side, the FBI partnerships, um, the DOE partnerships that I have, I would be losing this fight, right? Uh, as a chief information officer, of a utility company with some real adversaries that are coming to shut us down because if you can shut us down you can shut some of the capabilities completely off in Alaska so you know if it's 40 below and you can turn my power plant off uh, or my heat plant off um, from a you know threat actors perspective you can significantly limit what what the DOD is able to put into the fight uh, or the potential fight so uh, Doyne Utilities is a utility company that was really um, created just to run the Army's utilities in Alaska. Um, and, and everybody here sees Alaska on a map. I'm sure everybody in this room knows exactly how big Alaska is. But from the three main installations, the utilities are vastly different, right? Heat is a very big issue on one side of, of the plant. Um, again, if it shuts down, that base starts to freeze out at a certain period of time. Um, and then in other areas, we got to keep the power up for obvious reasons down south in J Bear and the water plants got to keep going. Or again, you start to, you know, really hold back what you're able to deploy as a force and a combatant commander. And I'm sure, again, you guys understand that piece, so I don't have to go through all that. And I will say that I don't use many acronyms um, as everybody else in this panel or everybody else I've heard talk. So um, I'll just throw that out there. I get lost a little bit, even though I'm actually a, a DOD person myself. Sometimes some of these, especially lawyers, love acronyms more than anybody else, I think. So uh, anyway, that's what that's what um, Doyon Utilities is. We're the Army's utilities. Uh, you know, we don't have the opportunity to fail. We have to provide safe, reliable utilities to those installations so that we can, um, you know, really provide that critical infrastructure space. So Eric, um, I may be jumping a little bit, but he came to our lawyer and said, hey, we want to get into this cooperative research and development agreement. And the lawyer, very, um, very on top of it, says, I, I don't really know what you're asking of me, but I've got somebody who does. And I saw this agreement and was very excited with one exception. I, I told Eric when I started talking, I said, if this is just a tabletop exercise where you want to come in and sit around a table like this, no offense, and talk about cyber and cyber defense, I don't want anything. You're wasting my time. 
That would be an absolute waste of what we have, the resources that we bring to bear on the civilian side and the resources that I know are out there on, uh, really at this point in time, the Air Force side from a cyber protection team. So, I, I, you know, it was really, really good conversation. Uh, it was a really innovative conversation. Again, partnerships and information sharing is a huge pillar of a strategy. When I came in that we set was if we don't have good information sharing, if we don't have good partners across the entire threat space to include uh, really now what we're doing here, then you know we're going to lose this fight from my perspective. And the civilian side is absolutely going to lose that fight without those type of partnerships. So I recently got to spend a week with the FBI, really, at their CISO Academy. I'm now here. So these partnerships are just, I just can't foot stomp enough that how critical they are and how, how really welcome they are. And hopefully they're beneficial both ways. And I, and I really think they are. Oh, absolutely, Aaron. I think so creators, you know, they're an imperfect tool, but they're really our best tool for public-private convergence. I just really want to emphasize this. It's, it's not a, one attorney at CyberCon when I was introducing the concept, he was like, are creators a panacea for all of our problems? I'm like, well, no, but it is one of our best tools for this sort of collaborative, you know, uh, working with the private sector on these problems. And so, Aaron, so what, what sorts of activities have we, have we done, with, you know, has the wing done with Doyen Utilities via the CREA? Yeah, yeah. So the 67th uh, sent us over to Scott. We got the 853rd. Uh, the Roosters came up for us, and which fantastic group. Um, you know, they, they have been back to Doyen Utilities three different times. We've looked at three different sets of utilities. Um, we're able to actually provide them with live data. So we were able to get them in effectively into our network without actually being into our network. We can't cross that barrier and uh, you know, disrupt obviously those operational pieces. So we talk operational technology. We're making water. We're making power. We're producing heat. Uh, the very first exercise actually convinced them to come up when it was quite cold outside. I think it was a shock to most of that team, but it was a good shock. Um, very professional. But the first, the first one was really just to look at one of our water plants. Just really, you know, we're going to provide them again with what's happening in our operational technology which looks an awful lot like an IT system with a little bit of um, variances here and there. But give them a good look at what a commercial um, water plant looks like. So, you know, this team had been used to looking at DOD installations, really Air Force water plants. So it was a different look for them to come in and look at what our water plant looked like. The type of traffic we were producing was relatively similar, but the way we were doing what we were doing across the space was definitely different to them, right? So we have, you know, our, we just, it was a different look. I don't have a bunch of airmen that are in there running this or a contractor um, from the perspective that are working with airmen. It was, a, it was really, this is a privatized utility that was running things, and I'd like to say much like a good, strong privatized utility should. Um, and then we progressed from there. So we expanded, and they were able to bring some very young team members out to see this space, as well as bring back some of their seasoned teams. Uh, everybody in this room knows that a good cyber defender gets sucked up by the uh, private sector almost as fast as they can get them. So some of that rotating piece was really, I think, helpful for that team. And it was helpful for us to get the look from the Air Force's side, what they had seen around the space, and the, and the pieces of, of that they were working on, um, you know, just from the cyber defense side. Uh, we'll get into some challenges too and, and I, I just i would say that one of the big challenges we've had and continue to struggle with and hopefully eric can help us sort some of these out kind of going forward is it's very difficult for us to share information back and forth at times we found uh, doing utilities is partially owned by a canadian company that created a significant roadblock um, it's some challenges with our dod partnerships so we sort of struggle with this information back and forth but just having them in three different years in a row, come back repetitively, work through them throughout the year. We've been out to visit their site um, at Scott. That, it's just been a, a super valuable partnership to us. I can go back to my shareholders and say, look at, look at the support we're getting. Go back to the Army and say, look at the support we're getting from the DOD as a whole. You know, we've got Air Force cyber teams inside a privatized utility that's directly supplying to our one customer, which is the Army. And that, that's a pretty powerful message, I think, across the space. It's been very successful. And thank you for that. And look how you teed up a legal issue for me to discuss so people can know how to partner with the government. So, yeah, so would Creda, so by default, when we have a Creda with a company, we can share uh, up to controlled unclassified information, you know, CUI, uh, with them, uh, assuming they have the appropriate systems to take on that CUI. Um, 
But then we can also do classified work under Kratos. So the Kratos joint work plan can sometimes require classified work. And if that's true, the company can use this as a justification to get a security clearance. We don't pay for it. They would have to pay for it. But they can use this as a justification. And at the, you know, when I was at the wing, uh, uh, there were several companies that were able to get security clearances because they had Kratos with us. So that's a way we can sort of expand the DIB. So getting at what makes cyber acquisition hard, you know, the DIB for cyber is quite small because, you know, there's there are often a lot of security clearance, you know, barriers, right, that make it harder for uh, companies that are just starting out to get involved. So Kratos are a way we can expand the DIB. Now, we're not, we don't enter into Kratos to get company security clearances. That's not why we would do it. But it is an incidental benefit of companies entering into Kratos with Cyber Command, with the Wing, um, you know, with other entities, with AFRL and places like that. Um, now, touching on the foreign ownership aspect, so yeah, there's three buckets of Kratos. There's just pure domestic Kratos, then there's foreign-owned U.S. subsidiaries, and then there's non-domestic Kratos, you know, purely, like, you know, they're in Japan or, you know, South Korea. And so with a domestic Kratos, you know, the idea of the technology transfer statutes and, you know, uh, you know, the creative statute is, you know, we can just pick any company we want to work with and we can just work with them, which is why it's very different from the FAR, where there's much more sort of procedures on who you can work with. Uh, now, with a foreign-owned U.S. subsidiary, we have to go to the office of the U.S. trade representative to get their sort of uh, concurrence. They're kind of looking at factors like, does that, com does that, this is the home country, not, you know, because it's a U.S. company, but it's foreign-owned, and does that, does that foreign company that owns it, does that host government, uh, does the home government uh, treat USIP rights with respect? You know, do they do enter into similar agreements with our companies? And sort of there's a reciprocity sort of notion. Um, and then when we do a pure non-domestic creda, then um, each DOD component for tech transfer has to kind of build out their procedures for, um, for doing pure non-domestic creders. One is to go out to the Office of US Trade Representative. But then you're probably going to want to do a more holistic approach. In Cybercom, we have a, a DOD technology transfer instruction that we published in September. Um, and it kind of lays out our procedures, and you know, we kind of put our J5 uh, kind of out in front on trying to do that coordination with the whole of U.S. government on how to kind of go out and do non-domestic creators. Um, and uh, so that just highlights a few issues. But yeah, so obviously his company uh, partially foreign-owned, so then that did kind of inhibit some information sharing. Um, we do hope, though, with companies that, you know, I think it, it, it so it's, it's a stumbling block, but, you know, overall, though, we think creators are a way to, to do information sharing, to do kind of blue-red teaming exercises, to do, um, you know, to uh, do kind of, a, you know, help do what we call technology uh, tra tradecraft transfer, uh, where we're tra transferring our skill sets and hunt, assess, and hardening to the partner, so that way they can help themselves. Um, so also, I, um, Aaron, I think you touched upon this a bit, but I guess why do you think it's beneficial for the cyber mission force to be able to experience private networks? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about partnerships. It's a theme um, across the space. Uh, you know, I, I think that just really what brings some good health on both sides is this relationship piece that we're building across the space. So, again, I think it's key for us to build a relationship and understand that we're protecting DOD assets and that, you know, we're helping support that mission and that those DOD assets are, in turn, really providing us with some insight to maybe better keep our, our utilities running and making sure that critical infrastructure piece is running. Again, th there are lots of different partnerships that we have, right? The FBI is obviously a key critical partner for us. Department of Energy is very helpful, and um, the Department of Energy is actually going to get over some of these hurdles of foreign-owned companies as well. So I think this information sharing is key. I think addressing and hitting these issues head-on and making sure we can get that data across has been very helpful, and I think even just the declassification that was talked about earlier and getting that out to where we can act on some of these really classified pieces all kind of play into this idea that we have a cooperative research and development agreement. We're helping build cyber defenders out there in the real world, as well as protecting assets that, that are, are right there on the front lines in a space that is very critical to our actions moving forward in the future to make sure that we're a good deterring force and, if necessary, a good engaged force. Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Aaron. So I guess we'd like to open up to questions if we have time. Um, we got time for one question. I'm curious. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if, if the if that if that trade program actually creates um, market. Thank you. Um, market uh, challenges with some of the national labs. Because it would seem like, especially like for, for Aaron, it would be there are national labs who's, who have 
either OT or other cyber-related directorates that would potentially overlap with Cybercom's mission in that space. So it's not unique that, like, I mean, there's different parts of the federal government have different missions. And so tech transfer, you know, the whole U.S. government does, does create us, right? Like Department of Energy, NASA, um, uh, HHS, they all have laboratories, you know, very broad definition of it. So even within DOD, you know, we have medical uh, institutions, right? So then they could be potentially having overlapping subject matter with HHS laboratories as well, right? So it's not a, it's not a unique issue, right? But um, we are trying to partner with the, with the interagency. Uh, we are kind of trying to deconflict some of these relationships we're working right now with our different partners and trying to figure out, hey, maybe you want to work with this, and maybe we'll work with this company. And we're also trying to find ways to um, have uh, different members of the interagency actually take part in our creatives as other participants, which in some cases is a possibility where they can kind of come, come under our authority and, and, and then take part in the R&D. Hey, let me jump on that because I, I love the pilot you guys came up with, but I'm going to stipulate it's completely not scalable for the challenge we face. You know, if we saw anything in Volt Typhoon and a lot of the reporting that's coming on, it's our adversaries are absolutely going to attack all of our military mobility all of our um, power generation, so our ports, our rail, our aviation. We can't make individual craters with each of these. There's some bases that we could uniquely uh, defend, and I'd put Alaska pretty high on that list. But we're absolutely, we actually have to, I would be careful micro-solving this problem, and I'd, I'd be stepping back and saying, how can we, at a macro level, ensure, and this goes back to the interagency, that the other agencies are doing their jobs, right? Coast Guard is properly working with the ports to ensure that the 19th Strategic Sea Lift ports are secure. That TSA is somehow they own rail, by the way, I'm not sure how, you know, is working with the six rail companies that move all our troops and forces and equipment across the country to ports and to aviation. How TSA is working with aviation, how energy is working with the power industry to ensure that we're defended because unlike every other warfare area, we don't own it. DOD. If it's a submarine threat, they got it. If it's an air threat, they got it. But when it's a cyber threat, we don't own the battle space, the infrastructure on which it's being fought. And we have to have those other federal agencies. We can't have, I love these pilot craters, but I, I, they cannot scale to the degree to defend, every, to defend all these areas. And that's really gonna take the department, really the White House, getting the other federal agencies to, to defend our national critical infrastructure with the same vim and vigor that the Department of Defense does it. And I'm going to tell you, 16 out of 17 of the other federal agencies aren't up for the fight right now. I think the goal is not to scale, I think, to the way, maybe not to what you're saying. We're not trying to replace CISA. I think CISA has a huge role. I mean, that, that this is their space. For us, this is more about conducting R&D, you know, so that our forces can be better prepared to support CISA. And so if there was an event, you know, like a disco event. So I think it, it, the goal is not for us to replace them. There are certain places that we pri you know, we're prioritizing based on input from the geographic combatant commands that maybe are supporting key U.S. military installations, but we're in no way seeking to, to take on responsibility for uh, all of that. And, uh, saying is, I think the other part of this is that you have to force that, you have to force the rest of the federal government to have this level of commitment. I think, so I think, I think that's time. All right, Eric, Aaron, Courtney, and Mark, sir, thank you for that fascinating and thought-provoking panel. If you had a bet uh, on the DFAR being described as beautiful more than once, you're the big winner. Your prize is out front. Um, but I do think this panel demonstrates that sometimes partners agree and can reach a, a wonderful outcome. Sometimes partners and friends don't agree. But through engagements and discussions, we can all mature and get to that point that our client is trying to get to and is in the best interest of the American people. So thank you. Please give a round of applause to our panel. And we are back on at 1435. You're on break. Hello, my name is Major Alex Holtzclaw, and I'm joined here by Captain Ray Macias. We are legal advisors with the U.S. Cyber Command's Office of the Staff Judge Advocate. We want to share with you what makes working at this office unique, challenging, rewarding, and why you should consider joining the DOD cyberspace operations legal community. The United States, along with many other countries around the world, maintains that international law applies to cyberspace. The DOD at large is committed to ensuring that cyber operations are conducted not only in accordance with international law, but with domestic law and policy as well. 
The law, however, remains very much unsettled in the cyber domain. The role of military cyber practitioners is to interpret and apply an evolving regime in real time, offering careful consideration of international law, domestic authorities and policy implications, and their impact on national and international security. It is not uncommon for cyberspace operations legal practitioners to advise commanders and decision makers on questions of sovereignty, constitutional principles, domestic criminal law, fiscal law, and even the law of armed conflict. For example, the prohibition against the use or threat of force during peacetime is generally well understood in the physical domain. In the cyber domain, applying treaty and customary international law becomes more challenging where cyber malicious activities are conducted below the use of force and where the identity of the threat actor may not be clear. Due to the low barrier to entry, state and non-state actors, including criminal organizations and violent extremist organizations, are acquiring sophisticated cyber capabilities at an alarming rate. Using this technology to target critical infrastructure, financial institutions, media platforms, and elections, cyber threat actors employ cyberspace to undermine democratic values while advancing their malicious goals. Events in the news demonstrate these issues are not mere hypotheticals or academic exercises. They are a present reality. Cyber legal practitioners enable the United States to maintain and extend our technological advantages in the cyber domain through development and acquisition of capabilities and talent needed to thwart malicious cyber actors today and stay ahead of future threats. Legal advisors perform a vital role in assisting commanders with making informed, risk-based decisions to ensure that our response to malicious cyber activities complies with applicable law and policy. We also help decision makers develop meaningful relationships with other federal agencies, international allies and partners, and the private sector to ensure that all stakeholders are working together to defend against foreign and domestic cyber threats. Experience in the operational environment, national security law, intellectual property, and contracts are all directly applicable to the DOD cyberspace operations legal practice. By encouraging respect for the rule of law and reinforcing norms of responsible state cyber behavior, as well as acquiring the necessary capabilities to maintain and extend our technological advantage, cyber law practitioners can ensure that the United States and its allies and partners are positioned to defend shared interests in the rapidly evolving strategic environment. We look forward to continuing this conversation through our practice and through the thoughtful dialogue here at the U.S. Cybercom Legal Conference. We encourage you to join us in the cutting edge legal practice of cyberspace operations. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are ready to begin our next session. And let me just start off by saying, who knew government acquisition and tech transfer would be one of our liveliest discussions yet? Uh, but we want to keep this energy going, and I am excited to introduce our next panel. This topic is and has been prevalent in the news. The role of the private sector, both in the Russia, Ukraine, and Israel and Hamas conflicts. What is the role of the private sector in conflict? But also, how does that role change and evolve prior to conflict as we move from the competition crisis to conflict phases? I am excited to introduce our moderator for today, Ms. Natalie Orbit, the executive editor of Lawfare and the deputy general counsel of the Lawfare Institute. Natalie, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so the premise that we have here for this panel is that there will need to be rapid fire communication and partnership between the private sector and government in times of conflict. But 
Before we even get there, I think it's clear to most of us that private sector and government actors sometimes speak quite different languages. And so it's useful to understand each other's vocabulary, understand each other's frame of reference. Um, so I want to get started there. Um, let me first introduce this illustrious panel before me. Um, so we have uh, Jonathan Horowitz, who is uh, a legal advisor for the International Committee for the Red Cross. Um, he focuses on new and emerging technologies in armed conflict, urban wa warfare, and partnered operations. Um, then we have Lori Blank, um, who is currently serving as special counsel to um, OGC at DOD. Um, see, I'm using acronyms too, even though I'm a civilian. Um, uh, she's on leave from her job at a, as professor at Emory Law School, um, where she directs the Center for International and Comparative Law and is the director of the International Humanitarian Law Clinic. Um, and then we have Adam Hickey, um, who is a partner at the law firm Mayor Brown um, in the Cybersecurity, National Security, and Government Investigations Practice Groups. Um, he was previously a Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the National Security Division of DOJ, and before that, an AUSA in the Southern District of New York. So, to get us started, um, I think we should start with the private sector, um, given our, our audience here. Um, and I want to just talk about, as I said, the, the um, baseline. So, we're in a pre-conflict, pre-crisis moment. Um, I want to talk about what private sector actors who may be, become very important for the purpose of partnerships in a time of conflict, what are they dealing with? What is their frame of reference? And what are the key pieces of vocabulary that they're using? Because it's not necessarily going to be obvious that the people later gathered around a boardroom table thinking about how to deal with a request that just came in from Cybercom. Um, are going to have just finished a conversation about an 8K or the GDPR. So, uh, so, so thanks, Natalie, and, and thanks to Cyber Command for having me here today. Um, and I, I like the way you're introducing this uh, as let's think about what normal looks like. What normal looks like, I think, for most companies, um, there are probably established information sharing relationships that may be with law enforcement, that may be with the intel community, there may be highlighting of threats that are seen through telemetry, there may be sharing with the public. Um, this is a very small piece, I think, of what most companies are thinking about day to day. Um, there are some technical legal restrictions on how you share information with the government, the Stored Communications Act and the like, but there are usually ways to work through them and companies find a way to share information when they need to and requests that come in from the government can be handled in the ordinary course. That's just a small piece of what you're thinking about if you're in-house legal. What you're really thinking about most of the time is an incredible intersecting patchwork of requirements, depending on how you're regulated. Um, the largest chunk of them have to do with incident reporting and thinking through when you have an obligation to tell some regulator or some state about a data breach or some foreign data protection authority. Uh, you're thinking about enforcement actions that target individuals like CISOs. And so now the environment of monitoring for a data breach and thinking about your response, now there's a sort of personal liability sometime at stake or viewed that way. And you're thinking about bad publicity, class action lawsuits, shareholder derivative suits, and that's just the legal part. You're also thinking about reputational concerns. You're thinking about how the products you sell or what you're doing um, uh, uh, relate to cooperation with the government and whether cooperation with the government could theoretically make it harder to sell those products or services, say, in Europe. You're thinking about um, skepticism in Europe and other parts of the world about the data you hold and where you get it and how you share it with the U.S. government or other governments. Um, and so uh, during the steady state period, I would say there are companies, maybe I'd bucket into two camps. There are those that have established normal steady state information sharing relationships and that could be pursuant to legal process or something else and then the rest of the companies that don't ordinarily think about this problem and so as you think as you as we talk about the shifting in perspectives I'll be interested in whether we're thinking about the companies like the large tech companies that already have those relationships or are we thinking about someone who's getting a request completely out of the blue because of where they happen to be located geographically or the product they happen to make 
Um, another consideration reputationally is also the attitudes of the workforce. Um, you know, periodically you will see innovative companies with workforces, you know, concerned about just how is our product going to be used and how does that company navigate wanting to participate at the cutting edge of technological development and be part of the procurement chain while at the same time um, having to deal with workforce concerns where people don't necessarily feel comfortable making weapons because they don't think that's what their job is. Um, and so I'll just, I'll sort of give you an example of what happened during steady state that I think is not the way to solicit cooperation. So imagine a circumstance where a three-letter agency is interested in records a company holds related to proliferation, the shipping of some sensitive equipment somewhere else in the world, and approaches a business leader in a company and asks to have a confidential, even classified relationship so that person can share information with a three-letter agency. And the business executive signs an NDA, feels very cool, shares the records, and months pass. And then later, the company gets a subpoena, um, apparently related uh, to a counterproliferation investigation from DOJ. The GC has no idea um, about this confidential relationship and has to pull teeth to figure out who was sending what to where in the government. The government, because this is a sensitive relationship, doesn't want to own up to what they were asking for or why they were asking for it. And there's the, at least the optic, two things are of concern. One, did this subpoena have something to do with the information we shared and are we sort of worse off because of our cooperation? And two, uh, you know, what if word got out that we are secretly sharing information of this kind with the government, what would our corporate affiliates think around the world? What would our customers think? What would other governments think? Um, yes, we only shared certain information, but what if people thought that our relationship was cozier and that we were somehow providing access that allowed for surveillance or the like, even though there's nothing in the record to suggest that? So. Cutting out legal, for example, would be my number one advice for what not to do if you're looking for cooperation. Okay, thank you. Um, Laurie, I want to come to you with the sort of broad question of from the frame of reference that you bring, both in your capacity as a scholar and now at DOD, in the pre-conflict, pre-even crisis point moment, what are the key sectors in the private sector and the key issues of concern to you? My microphone was <laughs> concern number one. Um, so first, thanks very much for having me. And I, I do need to start by saying that I'm speaking in my personal capacity um, and not on behalf of DOD um, or anybody else. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about the, and I'm, I'm kind of chuckling when you said pre-crisis, because I'm trying to imagine what, something that's not crisis. Imagine a land. Right? <laughs> imagine a, a land far, far away where fairies flit about, right? Um, but just thinking about it in the international law space, you know, a lot of the, and we're going to end up talking about thresholds and definitions and et cetera. Um, but those frameworks in international law are essentially there um, to provide stability, predictability, um, clarity maybe, <laughs> not usually, but possibly. Um, and ultimately laws, I like to think about it as about expectation. So if this happens, then this is the parameter of responses that I, state or other actor, um, have in my quiver of arrows, in my toolbox. And that's the sort of parameter of options that I would expect, a, I'm not going to say an adversary, but another actor in this magical pre-crisis land that we live in um, might have. And those are generally designed um, predominantly to keep us in that pre-crisis space, right? So we have, if another state engages in an unfriendly act, okay, you can do a retortion, et cetera. If you think you've been the victim of an internationally wrongful act, but it's not at a level of a use of force, you might be able to take countermeasures. If there's a use of force, if you're the victim of an armed attack, we have all of these thresholds and ultimately those are about keeping us in an environment in which we 
have some sense of what the rules or the reactions might be. And what that does is create that, that world of expectation, that world of predictability, even if, um, you know, we don't know what the result's going to be. We at least, the predictability is in the sense of this is the world in which it could happen. This is the general framing. And I think that's a really, for me, important sort of story about the, the international law piece. I think that's obviously relevant. I'll defer to Adam on the, you know, domestic side, but also for companies in thinking about what, you know, it's like a chess game. If I make this move, these are the things that could happen or might happen or would, should not happen. Um, and that's, that's sort of how we try to avoid moving up that scale that you're going to take us up through, right? And then things happen that bust us through those barriers. Um, but I think that framing, and so part of, I think, one thing that's useful in thinking about this public private sector partnership, et cetera, is whether it's education, whether it's communication, whether it's um, partnership, awareness, whatever the right word is, is that there is a common language for that, or at least a common awareness, so that you're not operating in silos where one entity, those in the public sphere, the states, et cetera, have a certain set of expectations, but their potential or erstwhile partner is not living in that world and so doesn't see those same sets of thresholds, expectations, potential reactions. So, Great, thank you. Um, Jonathan, I guess same question to you and also I think just as a, a starting point, you know, I think most people when they think of the ICRC are not necessarily thinking of engagement with the private sector in a pre-crisis, you know, we're not talking about use and bellow for sure, um, at least not yet in our conversation. Um, so tell us about um, what your concerns are in this period and especially I think the paper that you wrote recently about educating private sector actors about international law I think speaks very much to what Laurie was just saying. Great, um, thank you for the question. Thank you to U.S. Cyber Command for, um, for the invitation. It's great to be on a, a panel with everyone. So let me, if I can, for all of you, just give a little bit of perspective of where the ICRC approaches this issue, whether it's in situations of armed conflict or more to your questions, outside of situations of armed conflict. And it's not gonna be anything particularly surprising, but ultimately it's an environment where um, civilians, governments, uh, governance, municipal institutions are just highly connected to the digital environment um, for everything, um, for essential services, for transport, uh, for agriculture, for distribution of food, for uh, voting, whatever it may be. Um, and what we're also seeing um, is as that is uh, moving forward, we also realize there's considerable reliance on all those uh, access points uh, with the private sector um, in terms of digital infrastructure, uh, governance, essential services. And we also see that that relationship and that partnership is building and building and building, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it seems like it's sort of a logical trajectory of how the technology is working, how society is working, how governments um, are working and the types of relationships that they are building um, with the digital uh, tech sector um, uh, with the private sector um, writ large. At the same time, though, we're realizing that that also increases the vulnerability of all of us um, to different types of um, cyber intrusion, cyber disruptions, and, and things like that. So things are becoming very connected across both um, in peacetime, we would say sort of people and governance, but of course, if we talk about moving into situations of armed conflict, we're talking about a lot of interconnectivity between now we're moving over to civilian stuff and military stuff. And so what the ICRC is seeing is that we're seeing an environment where things getting increasingly tangled up with one another um, for purposes of uh, cost effectiveness, uh, resilience, things like that in peacetime. And then we're starting to not only imagine, but actually see what happens when that runs into 
a situation of armed conflict where you have different norms, different standards, but different legal obligations and different legal frameworks. And so that's one of the reasons why either as a somewhat preventative measure um, or as a reactive measure, the ICRC is taking increased interest in speaking to the private sector about these issues. So the ICRC has been around for 161 years now. We've become pretty comfortable talking to folks uh, who are here sitting with us in military uniform to professional uh, mili uh, military institutions, very normal. Um, we've seen a proliferation of non-state armed groups um, over the years. I think we're at a count of 2021 of about um, 600 plus. We've engaged with around 400 plus uh, of those non-state armed groups. The private sector is still something, uh, is still a part of the uh, battlefield landscape, uh, is still an actor that's increasingly in that landscape that the ICRC is trying to, to Lori's point, um, learn how to communicate their interests with our concerns, um, um, our concerns with their interests. And, and that's something that um, is, a, is a project that's ongoing, but we see it as one that will continue to be relevant over time, um, not one that is sort of a blip in history that will go away at any particular um, moment in the near future. Okay, so let's move into our crisis phase. Um, and I think we can here think about as a preliminary matter, in a, in a world of cyber activity, um, policing the line between armed conflict and not armed conflict seems particularly complicated. And not only complicated, but perhaps not a matter of consensus among different decision makers. So let's talk about the phase at which it's very clear that tensions are reaching a boiling point. Um, just to throw out a couple of examples, you know, say that a social media platform is being used to coordinate an armed attack, what seems like it will become an armed attack, and then we see actual activity on the ground. Um, imagine that a data broker is unwittingly selling data to an, an adversary or someone who will soon become an adversary. Um, what are the things that you are thinking about and that need to be coordinated between the private sector and government actors at this phase. Um, I can start with whoever. Laura, you want to start? So one thing we haven't raised yet, but I think is um, kind of the, it's not really the elephant in the room, but it's certainly a significant issue is state responsibility. Um, and so anytime we're talking about um, this phase of, you know, tensions increasing, I mean, as you're giving examples, I'm thinking to myself, well, the immediate question has to be, did some threshold get crossed? What is the, what is the range of options, right? If you're thinking as a legal advisor, here's your range, you know, this is your left and right limits then the policymaker has to decide, well, what, just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do something. Hopefully it doesn't go the other way. Um, and, um, but, so, so one piece of this is trying to assess what, um, what action that I'm either um, absorbing, that I'm watching develop, that I am, concerned about developing, et cetera. Um, do any of these um, trigger certain reactions that I might be able to take, again, as a state? Um, and that's assuming that you're on the receiving end of such activity. And so then we're thinking about um, things like prohibited intervention. Um, we're thinking about whether or not some act that might trigger the authority to use countermeasures has taken place. We might be thinking about whether a use of force has happened, or you mentioned possibly an armed attack. Um, the, the essential piece of that then is, of course, who is responsible for this conduct um, and trying to then assess, okay, is it a state actor? Is it a, we've been talking about, quote, 
our side's commercial private sector. But we have to remember there's a commercial and private sector and there are private actors that are that side. Again, if we're now in a crisis phase, we start to have sides. So who is responsible within the international law construct for that? Um, and is there a state that bears responsibility? In which case, as a state, I might have certain available avenues of action. Or is it a non-state entity and I cannot make the attribution connection, but then I would have other avenues. Maybe there are sanctions, maybe there's criminal law avenues, maybe there's any number of possibilities there. Um, and so that's one piece of it is understanding the attribution piece. The flip side of that attribution question is when are the actions um, or activities of the folks we've been talking about engaging with now would be somehow be attributable to the state on our side. And that's an equally important piece. And that I think gets very much um, into some of the discussion that we've been having about um, uh, understanding the relationship, about sort of building awareness, education, training. And that goes both ways, right? It's not just the, hey, commercial entity, let me share with you how international law works or how we view this question or this is what happens. But it's also understanding what is the nature of this commercial entity's activities, right? I un and, and deepening our understanding of the connection between those activities and the government and the state um, or perhaps linkages with partners and allies. And so trying to understand that and knowing when, okay, I've been busy thinking about my own activities, but I got to be aware of what commercial actor is doing. Um, let's take an example that is the more extreme example here, which is space, right? We've been thinking about cyber, but it's kind of, a, they're, they're integrally linked, right? And in space, we have an entirely different regime of state responsibility. We're not just talking about the idea of, you know, acting under the direction and control of, which we might, you know, the kind of general rules and attribution we see in the draft articles. Um, but in space, we have a regime from the Outer Space Treaty, which says that states bear international responsibility for national activities in space. And all of a sudden, most things that happen, either on your territory or by um, you know, actors in your territory, become either definitely the responsibility of the state or potentially the responsibility of the state, depending again on how you understand what national activities is and, and all these other questions. Um, to the extent that cyber and space have a very symbiotic relationship, which in many ways they do, um, it's important to understand all of those pieces and to know what those different, you know, sort of domestic commercial actors are doing so you know how to plan and how to foresee what's coming. Yeah, and which state is responsible for a multinational corporation that is in space. Um, I think, uh, Adam, I'd like to pick up with you because um, Lori spoke about you know acting as an attorney in the government and coming up with the left and right parameters, of what's doable, and then needing to turn to the policymaker to make the decisions. And really in the private sector, at least when you're talking if, about um, corporations, the person that they that the lawyer is consulting with is not a policymaker, or is, in, I suppose, in some sense, but is really someone who's charged with being concerned with business risk and with some of the other considerations that you mentioned earlier. So, can you talk about how that differs? Yeah, I, I guess I would say the mission is a little simpler, maybe, in the private sector because if you have shareholders, you're prime directive is to maximize value to them. And then as we enter crisis, what that means, I think, becomes more complicated. So I think since at least the DDoS attacks on the banks in 2012 and 2013, and probably well before that, companies came to understand that cyberspace was going to be a, an area where they might face the brunt of retaliation for frustration with US government policy. So I think there is very much a sense that even if they don't do nothing at all or have nothing to do with the crisis as it develops, they might end up feeling the consequences of it. So internally, if you see storm clouds brewing, one, it's gonna matter whether is the US a part of this or not? Are we 
are we over here and sort of picking a side to help or not help or just stay out of the way? Or is this actually implicating the homeland and the U.S. government? Because I do think that will make a difference. Second, is there a good guy and a bad guy? Or is this an incredibly complicated situation where whichever move we make is going to tee off a significant chunk of our constituency? Because that will matter to reputational risk. Third, um, how are we as a company exposed? Where are our personnel? What are our supply uh, chains? What is our network exposure? And do we need to reposition or rethink what we're doing or how we're doing it just to stay out of the way so that we aren't, you know, this isn't primarily our problem. So how do we just keep maximizing value without being caught in the middle of this? Um, is there a risk of retaliation to our employees at some point because of where they're physically located? Um, what is the U.S. government going to use sanctions, its sanctions authority for? And do we need to be ready to divest or get out of the way quickly because something may be illegal for us to continue to do business in the way we're doing business? Um, that, I think, is sort of the short list of things that would occur to me on day one of crisis, uh, depending on where the company's doing business. Okay. And Jonathan, I think this is really the moment at which I suspect with, at least with smaller or less sophisticated private sector actors, they may all of a sudden realize they really need Jonathan Horowitz to come and talk to them and explain. Um, so what is, uh, what is on your mind at this moment and what are you going to be advising them? Um, well, um, I feel like I should be wearing a mask and a cape or something with that description. Thank you. Um, no, I mean, I, I think what, what, what the ICRC is finding, and it, and it really blends nicely um, what was just mentioned, is that while there's um, a natural understanding of some of the security risks um, involved in um, uh, situations of armed conflict, um, naturally, um, that there's not always a full understanding of what the legal frameworks are that apply, right? And so a lot of companies, and I would say it's not even sort of um, uh, uh, only in relation to small or medium, but I think it, it really depends on the personalities involved and, and lawyers that are in the companies um, trying to be aware and understand that there is a legal framework that is in many ways so abnormal to what it is that they think about on a day-to-day -day, um, and trying to comprehend what to do about that, either from a risk management or from how to engage in contracts with partners is really something that the ICRC is trying to, to drive at. So what's the examples, that the types of examples that I'm talking about? Um, the types of examples that I'm talking about are things like where a um, private technology company provides goods or services to a belligerent in a party to an armed conflict such that their uh, infrastructure might uh, qualify as a military objective. And do company executives know that? And do their lawyers know that? Um, that is sort of the issue that I think is very much on our minds. It's been in the public. These are not abstract theoretical discussions. Yes, I wrote a law journal <laughs> article on it. It was based on things that the ICRC was operationally seeing in the environments that we're working on. Um, at the extreme end of this uh, sort of set of examples has to do with employees. Are employees of technology companies um, engaging in activities that would, in some way, shape, or form, constitute direct participation in hostilities. Now, the ICRC has its views on how to interpret the definition of direct participation of hostilities. States disagree with, their, with each other on what constitutes direct participation in hostilities, but the concept everyone agrees exists. Um, and there's large agreement on the criteria for direct participation in hostilities for civilians, at which point, of course, we all know it means they lose protection for such time as they do that from even a kinetic attack. So it could be a life or death conversation or consideration. That is also something that the ICRC thinks should at least be part of the um, risk management, risk assessment, risk evaluation. Now, that does not mean that we think that all other risk management and assessment models should be tossed out the window because IHL is a prevailing legal framework that all companies must automatically sort of drop everything and pay attention to. 
But it's a blind spot if, if, if company lawyers and leadership are unaware of that dyna dynamic, if they're unaware that the international humanitarian law rules and principles allow for that possibility of company property qualifying as a military objective um, and therefore losing what the ICRC regards as otherwise its um, default status as a civilian object and from civilian employees, which is how the ICRC regards technology company employees, lose for those exceptional, uh, under those exceptional circumstances, um, their protection because they are directly participating in hostilities for such, su such time as they do so. Um, so that's, that's sort of the space that we're um, entering into. It's gonna be more relevant for some companies than others. It's gonna be an immediate uh, point of relevance for some companies, and it may be one that is a future relevant um, for other companies, depending on where they're physically located, where they want to be physically located. Um, so, so there's a lot to do here, but we're trying to sort of put a, a flag in the sand to um, to sort of register some concerns that are based on real life operational um, circumstances that we're seeing um, across. And it's not just one or two armed conflicts, but but across several. And it does seem to me that if you are talking to a private sector actor for whom you can say, actually, this law is really important to you because you may be converted to a military actor and therefore become legally tar targetable, it's more likely to get someone's attention. Um, so let's switch into our uh, armed conflict, or our, our uh, IHL hat is on. Um, we are in our full-fledged armed conflict. Um, so let's talk about, um, Adam, to start with you, what kinds of questions your clients will be asking you, and I think just as salient, what questions you expect that they may not even think to ask along the lines of what, what Jonathan was describing. So I struggled a bit um, in preparing for this because I don't know what the ask is from the U.S. government in this hypothetical. Um, I don't... Why? Well, here are, th here are three basic categories of asks, right? Are you buying a product from me? Are you, are you, is it the standard procurement federal services? You want a, a service that the military or the government will rely on that's analogous to what I provide off the shelf or is principally for militaries anyway. I feel like that's, a, that's an easier bucket because the companies that sell that are used to thinking about their role in conflict to begin with. Um, are you asking for tips or leads or information sharing outside the context of process, like a more sort of soft cooperation? And there, I think, you start thinking about things like, um, and here, maybe it's not the U.S. government asking, maybe it's, you know, a sympathetic country, but you're thinking about how will the information I provide be used? Will it be used to commit a violation of IHL, which is something you have to think about a little bit. Um, you do think about whether you're getting drawn into uh, a conflict with that. You also think about the laws that govern sharing with the US government and the like. And so that's one second type of ask. And the third type of ask, which is, I'll just call it the weird ask. So it's the surreptitious access to the company's network or products or something that's secret, not paid for, not procured, and it's kind of a, an under the table cooperation, which I can't even, really imagine the full range of things, but I can imagine happening in conflict. And there, I think, is the highest level of risk for the company because there's what you're doing and then there's what could maybe become public at one point, what the claim is for retaliation that's justified, what other customers are, you know, I mentioned the Europeans and so forth, what, what they're going to think about this. So I guess to answer your question, I need to know what the ask is, and it gets progressively harder the more we walk down that road. But the basic categories of legal questions would be, is it, is it prohibited? Are we being asked for something that's somehow a violation of either this law or another domestic law? Then you think about the bucket of retaliatory or reputational risks. And I would fold IHL a little bit into that, although I'll be candid that I don't feel like some of our adversaries are really consulting with Jonathan on when the targets are legitimate or not. So I would be inclined to approach this a little more gorilla-like. <laughs> Um, I think the clients would think less about whether they've crossed the line in some legal sense to warrant retaliation as a more basic, am I going to get tagged with this and is it going to come back to bite me, whether the law says it can or not, if that makes sense. Um, Laura, you've been eager to get to our conflict moment, um, but uh, let me ask you also, um, you know, under international law, 
the role of the private sector and the way in which cooperation happens has very different implications, both for the risk exposure of the private actor as well as the potential liability, legal or otherwise, of the U.S. government. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so I actually wanted to add a couple of buckets to your buckets. Um, Please do. I, like we, we're, yeah, also, um, I forgot to mention insurance, but we can come back to that. Oh, I definitely was not going to mention insurance, so okay. Um, I try never to mention insurance. Um, so I was, um, I, I would add in um, to that things that are not as obviously driven by a relationship between the company and the government or potential relationship between them. Um, and so activities that are part of the um, company's business, uh, like say the provision of satellite services or the provision of any number of services to perhaps other private actors, um, to any number of other groups, we see that um, it, it is not a new story that states do not are not the you know monopolistic actor during armed conflict anymore. So that would be one one piece. You develop an app that is you intend it to be used for X, and during conflict, enterprising, innovative, you know, creative people figure out they can use it for Y, and all of a sudden, what does that mean? both for your company, what does it mean for the way the government is gonna think about your company, right? And we have lots of examples from Ukraine about both the, the actual deliberate development of apps for the purpose of providing information and so on, but also just the use of other things, of crowdsourcing information about violations. Um, and so if you're a company that somehow that's sort of part of the services that you provide in the pre-conflict stage and now it gets used what does that mean? Um, and the the other one, I think, is is driven by the everyday, um, unremarkable, um, ordinary level of integration and redundancy between civilian and military networks, right? I think there's some, I don't remember, I, I statistic I saw that was cited several years ago was something like 98% uh, you know, sort of overlap between military and civilian networks. I have no idea what the actual number is. I just was like in doing some reading, you know, uh, for this, I saw that. And I thought, well, that's a pretty high number. Um, so what does that mean um, in terms of if the, the company uses those same pathways of communication, those same, um, you know, maybe even an easier example is, um, a satellite bus with multiple payloads on it. One of those payloads is military. Um, one of those is your company's to do whatever, maybe you provide weather forecasting, any number of things. Just understanding the exposure that your company's assets, that your company's services, that your company's people have by dint of being essentially cheek by jowl with military capabilities and military assets and military objects um, that's also critically important. You may have nothing to do with the conflict. You may be trying to stay far, far away from it, but just the nature of our current system of communication and, and cyber space and everything is that you can't, you, you can't escape it, right? You're trying to get away and you're intimately tangled together. I do think um, the example of uh, companies, I think, are, have an easier time dealing with misdirection or misuse of their products, right? When it comes to, like, let's, say, let's imagine the conflict is over there and my, you know, app is being misused in that way. I can take that on board and I can use the same framework I use to think about sanctions, export controls, or any number of, like, content on the platform. What do I do about that? Terrorist use of the internet, so forth and so on. There's a framework of, like, okay, I don't want my thing to be used that way anymore and you can deal with that. I think that harder piece is this, the last bucket you mentioned where I don't fully appreciate who I'm riding along with and I maybe not be fully prepared for the disruption. I may not even be a target, but I'm not f prepared for the operational disruption that comes with being in cyberspace or physically located in a particular zone. 
nor do I think companies are used to, um, even though, I mean, I, I think they're oddly, we, we haven't dealt with a situation where the U.S. is in conflict and making extraordinary ass for the private sector. And I, I can't really predict how that will go. And I think that's, I, I think that is kind of the elephant in the room is like, what if the conflict involves us and another power that, it, that we are exposed to as a company in their market? That is going to be much more complicated and how to work through that. Um, Because, you know, some of your questions, Natalie, in advance were related to legal authorities. And I I was in a lot of meetings in government where people were throwing around statutes written many, many years ago that I think don't quite let you do that. (laughs) And, like, the DOJ guy, me, would be like, shut up. Okay, so we're not going (laughs) to. But, like, I just think we're not used to thinking through, because we don't have a command economy, it's going to be very interesting sort of how we get to the right place. It's not going to be, I think, by hard law. It's going to be through sort of clear communication by the government to the companies of what the ask is and sort of them thinking through our, what are our risks and how we're going to approach that ask. And then there's insurance, by the way. So to what extent, <laughs> when you say yes, are you implicating sort of not only the, the risk of retaliation, but also are you, you know, tripping up something that you would otherwise pay you back you know, help reimburse you for costs because you've suddenly made yourself a combatant in a way that voids your policy. And just to jump in really quick on the insurance piece, and I don't have the statutes and things at my fingertips, but um, understanding what it means when a statute says, you know, at war, when it has these war-related phrases in it that all of a sudden uh, trip up what, you ex- what your expectations are of your insurance coverage. Um, I think is also important. One thing that I would um, reflect on is that um, the issue of um, bridges, airports, roadways, hills being used by civilians and being used by militaries have long plagued legal advisors providing advice to whoever they need to provide advice to on how the rules of international humanitarian law apply. Um, It might be slightly on steroids a little bit with regard to um, the digital ecosystem where that's happening, but these are not unique issues to the battle space or to international humanitarian law. Um, I think they are unique issues to the private sector that hasn't operated in a conflict environment where they raise tricky questions. And so in so much as there are hot debates around what constitutes an attack under international humanitarian law and what protections international humanitarian law afford civilian data and whether it's the same protections that's afforded to civilian objects or live issues. Um, The ICRC has positions on them. Some states have positions on them. Some states differ on their positions. Some states have decided not to take a position on them. So I don't want to say that everything's easy and it's just a matter of, you know, transferring what we know from the more conventional kinetic world of international humanitarian law into the cyber uh, context. But it means that those struggles have been there for a long time. And the reason why I say this is because I think some people who uh, their contact point with international humanitarian law for the first time is a very complicated issue, will immediately go to their comfort zone of other legal frameworks. Um, And I guess what we're trying to say is there are already legal frameworks in place. Um, They do provide operational legal challenges. Um, That is true for cyberspace, but that is not new to cyberspace. Um, and we were talking about a tagline, and I think um, that is true to cyberspace, but that is not new to cyberspace is maybe one that I'll go with. Um, but, 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 but that's a big reflection point for, for the ICRC, right? Our, our point is you don't need to go reinventing the wheel. Don't go making new international humanitarian law unless you're certain there's a gap there. Um, IHL does a lot of work with regard to military uh, cyber operations but it does require um, socializing, disseminating, explaining, and working through difficult questions that have existed long before the difficult questions that we're discussing on this panel. I can just jump in, I think. Jonathan, you, you, what you're talking about raises, kind of brings us all the way back to the initial conversation about 
the importance of communication and and awareness and so on because the when you're talking about you know we've been thinking about these questions about when a hill or a bridge etc the difference of course is that you can see the bridge you can see the hill you can see military activity potentially happening there etc you can't see when there's overlap in the cyber world now obviously there will be um you know both government and commercial actors who have significant visibility into the space where they're operating and who else is operating there but you still don't have particularly if we if we kind of step back from those big actors into other private actors right as an individual user you probably have absolutely no idea what the level of whether you know overlap or integration might be between you know the network on which i send my emails or it, just to be oversimplified and a network on which the military might be sending you know comms during a conflict and now i think my email is going to get to mom but it as actually you know that data is if it can be considered data as an et cetera et cetera all those arguments right it's now incidentally um harmed in some way right i've taken liberties with the law there but you understand the point um and so i think that's one piece that kind of <coughs> emphasizes the need for whatever conversations are helpful to increase this level of awareness is because um you can't see literally visually those overlaps those things and as you're saying you might not even you know, be thinking about that because you're busy thinking about your own lane and it's not in your face that, whoa, there's military activity happening right there. Whereas if you were a, a factory and you saw, you know, troops exercising before deployment on the next field over, again, to be super simplified, you might say, huh, we're really close to those people. Maybe that doesn't seem like the safest thing, right? That would be a very obvious visual manifestation of it but we don't have that and i think that actually is somewhat consequential thanks um i want to take some questions and um in the meantime i will invite the three of you to think about um coming out of this discussion if the goal here is to build durable partnerships to have clear and successful means of coordinating between private and public or i'm sorry between private and government um, what would be the sort of top one or two things that you would advise um, that are really necessary for getting those into place? Now I will open it up for questions. Hello. Okay. So it sounds like we've all sort of agreed that uh, some sort of pre-crisis land of milk and honey education is required sort of with all interested parties. I guess the question then, if that is the case, uh, for sort of a better understanding across the board pre-crisis, is the allocation of the current allocation of responsibility between public and private sector adequate? Is it correct? Does it put the responsibility on the right party to begin the conversation, to continue the conversation, and who should sort of bear that burden? Um, well, I'll come back. It, it, I don't know. Um, I don't still know what the ask is. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. So take procurement out, right? So if, if the government wants something and it can buy it, there's a way of handling that. There's a policy to process in a company. So take procurement out. Okay. So then what's, what's left is something that's hard to predict, but some kind of cooperation between the government or warning. I would just say the best examples I can point to are ones where, and this has often been in the law enforcement context where I've seen it, law enforcement goes to a company, proposes, say, a disruption operation or a takedown or a cyber operation, use whatever term you want, and is pretty transparent about what it wants to do and how it wants to do it. it sometimes gets a court order, so there's a transparency, and it eventually becomes public. It's easier, I think, for a company to think through that and make an informed decision. What I, would, what I would suggest to you is not what we cannot do now, because no one here is saying what company will be asked to do what outside of procurement, is plan in advance for that moment. So I don't know how you have the shifting of the burden from the public to the private sector or the like until there's a very clear understanding of, okay, what are you exactly asking me to be ready for? And I've been in many conversations where the government's ask is not because of the sensitivity of it, 
not made clearly. And so the recipient doesn't really understand what the government's trying to do or why they're trying to do it. And so I would just say, if you're planning for the future, plan to communicate transparently um, in, the, in the crisis or in conflict. It's gonna have to look a lot different from the fairly vague, I can only tell you so much, that comes over in steady state periods sometimes, outside of procurement. I, can I just add to that? So uh, the other thing that, that we've been observing, which, I, which should be obvious but isn't o always, is that um, different companies provide different goods and services, which means the legal ramifications are completely different, right? So social media platforms compared to um, cloud computing services compared to um, different types of information technology uh, providers are going to engage with risks around situations of armed conflict and they're going to engage with the rules of international humanitarian law very, very differently. And so I think this goes to the point that there also needs to be um, and I don't mean transparent in the sense of publicly available, but transparent in the sense of what is the private sector, what is the government specifically asking the private sector to do? And then at least with my international humanitarian law ICRC hat on, what are the legal implications that can pose particular risks, whether from a targeting perspective or confiscation of property perspective um, or uh, worker safety perspective, we're talking about direct participation of hostilities, that those questions and that conversation needs to be a transparent one between um, the service provider and in this case we're talking about a, a belligerent, a party to an armed conflict. So that's a government private sector dialogue that has to happen. I think generally there's a broader dissemination sort of conversation, that's what this is, that's why I'm so pleased that uh, this panel was part of U.S. Um, Cyber Command's annual legal conference. I think that is part of the um, sort of road to sort of success on, on trying to explore these issues that are not, in my estimation at least, going away um, uh, anytime soon. And then I think it is going to be incumbent, perhaps even before some of those conversations with governments, for technology companies to look inwards. They're probably not gonna, again, wanna do it publicly, to do an, their own self-evaluation, self-assessment. What is our infrastructure? What are our goods and services being used for? They've covered a lot of risks. Um, the insurers force them to, regulators force them to think about these things, um, but that's largely absent from these issues that we've been talking to, uh, talking about today in terms of you know, targetability, um, whether it has to do with property or, or personnel. So I think there are a number of different um, entry points to, to have a conversation, and I think they can go in a lot of different directions depending on what the issue is that you're trying to resolve and what question you're being asked. Okay, another question? Please. Mr. Horowitz, among the core principles of the ICRC are impartiality and neutrality. Given the involving nature of the battlefield, cyber activities and such, and technology, have there been or do you foresee instances in which the ICRC would withhold or limit that assistance to victims on the battlefield? Um, thank you for the, the question. Is that, am I right that that is not a cyber specific related question? No, it's just, uh, when I see the term business of battle, like I, I, I just have connotations of how it's changing, evolving. Uh, when we think of armed conflict, it's evolving to something now where we can have conflict that's not geographically isolated to a particular region. It can be uh, cyber attacks that are, are conducted uh, from outside the region. Um, and when I think of the ICRC's traditional assistance of providing that humanitarian aid to victims on the, on the battlefield, but with cyber activities, you don't know who's the belligerent anymore. I think, if I correct, you, you began your presentation by mentioning there are some 600 non-state actors of which ICRC has assisted about 400, or at least are aware of about 400. Are there some of those non-state actors, for example, that you would not support um, because it might be a breach of your uh, core principles of impartiality and neutrality? Great, thank you for, the, for, the, um, for the, taking the time to clarify that. Um, so um, the ICRC is going to engage 
with any party to an armed conflict because every party to an armed conflict has legal obligations under international humanitarian law. So if a government is particularly unhappy with a non-state armed group, labels them a criminal gang, labels them a terrorist organization, as a legal matter under international humanitarian law, the ICRC sees them through the lens of a party to an armed conflict who has legal obligations under international humanitarian law. They have an obligation to respect uh, uh, and ensure respect for those obligations, and so we are going to engage with them. There's a separate question around how we provide humanitarian assistance, right? So those are two different things. Those are operational dialogues, that's the first thing that I was mentioning, and then there are questions around providing humanitarian assistance. The bulk of what we do is going to be for civilian populations, including those who are under the control of parties to an armed conflict, whether they're a non-state armed group or whether they're a, uh, a part of a um, government um, military. Um, I do not see um, what's happening with regard to the digital ecosystem in conflict changing how the ICRC would approach its neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Um, I'm not sure if that gets to the, the question you're asking, but, but I appreciate being asked. Thank you. We are running up against time, so um, my challenge to you has um, gone up in ante, and now you must have a bumper sticker explanation of what your um, main takeaways would be of how to promote cooperation and partnerships. Adam, you want to start? I used it on the question. <laughs> That's my bumper sticker. <laughs> Uh, my bumper sticker would be um, beware of the line between engaging and all of a sudden um, uh, bearing attribution and responsibility for. So we'll be careful or think about where that line is in engaging with the um, private sector and yet not having them operating under your direction and control. Jonathan? Uh, the private sector uh, has protections under international humanitarian law. It can lose those protections, and it also has obligations. Read the Geneva Conventions, read the additional protocols, and give the ICRC a call if you have any questions. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Adam, Lori, Jonathan, and Natalie, thank you so much for your insightful discussion on the role of private sector from competition to conflict. Your viewpoints, particularly as you walked through each phase, were invaluable and certainly highlights the need for the legal advisor throughout. So thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are on. On behalf of Coast Guard Cyber Command, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to provide insight into Coast Guard Cyber Command's Office of the Staff Judge Advocate. First established as an independent operational command in 2018, Coast Guard Cyber Command has rapidly grown and expanded its operational footprint and capabilities to support Coast Guard missions and national security interests. CG Cyber's legal team has grown with it, both in the number of attorneys assigned and in the scope of their practice. As both a military service and a law enforcement and regulatory agency, the Coast Guard is uniquely positioned to address cyber threats. A core component of our mission is to help protect the marine transportation system and the $5.4 trillion in economic activity that it supports. On a daily basis, Coast Guard Cyber Command's Maritime Cyber Readiness Branch and Cyber Protection Teams are working with maritime industry partners to assess networks for vulnerabilities and to respond to cyber incidents. In the last year, our three cyber protection teams carried out 30 assessment, hunt, or incident response missions on critical infrastructure. Those teams are supported by lawyers who ensure sensitive and proprietary information is protected while cyber threat information is shared with key stakeholders. Coast Guard Cyber Command is also the primary defender of the enterprise mission platform, which includes all US Coast Guard technology from cyber threats. The Coast Guard's history of cooperation with allies, partners, provides a template for advancing our shared interests in cyberspace. Our legal team works in close coordination with Department of Homeland Security programmatic offices, the Department of Defense, FBI, other federal, state, local government partners, and foreign allies to defend our critical infrastructure and leverage our shared expertise to protect U.S. interests. Through strategic arrangements and relationships, 
maritime authorities and institutions are developing cyber incident response capabilities alongside established all hazard responses. CG Cyber's lawyers are actively engaged in these efforts, analyzing authorities, assessing risk, and crafting solutions that will form the plans and policies for addressing evolving threats. As advisors for a new and evolving operational command, Coast Guard Cyber Command judge advocates regularly address issues of first impression. Our analysis supports critical operational needs by assessing constitutional, statutory, and regulatory implications, but our operations also require constant engagement on issues ranging from administrative law, information law, military justice, ethics, fiscal law, and international law. CG Cyber's legal office is developing the workforce and talent that will keep pace with challenges and opportunities of the future. It's an exciting time to be in the Coast Guard and a part of the enterprise that will shape the way we secure our digital ecosystem. Hello. Do you often find yourself pondering big questions? Such as, what can I do with my life after working for the government as a civilian employee or military member? Are you contemplating retirement or separation from service? Have potential employers asked you if you have a post-government employment letter that they want you to submit with your job application? If so, you need a post-government employment briefing. Have you recently received a gift from a foreign entity or personage? Do you know if you can keep it? Find out with an ethics review. Have you been invited to speak at an event sponsored by a non-federal entity? Do you know that you can do it in either your official capacity or your personal capacity? Have you been offered free travel? Come to us to find out if it's legally permissible for you to accept that or not. Is your spouse trying to launch a reality TV career and wants you to participate? Do you want to find out what you can do to support them without losing your job, IRL? Do you inexplicably have enough energy to pursue off-duty employment? Find out your parameters before accepting an additional job. Do you perchance aspire to emulate a dragon and have a hoard of gold and challenge coins? Ensure that you're handling those coins correctly with an ethics review. Are you handling multi-billion dollar contracts and just happen to be inspired to invest in the stock market? Pump the brakes on that investment and discuss it with your friendly neighborhood ethics attorney first. Do contractors try to slide into your DMs to reach out to you to try to arrange meetings to educate you about their latest developments? Do you know what to say? We do. Does using the appropriate appropriated funds appropriately cause you consternation or stomach upset? Does ORF make you itch? You're in good company. Talk to your ethics advisor about how to, and if you can, fund that tea party that you're planning. Failure to loop your ethics advisor in for review may cause severe side effects, including job loss, attorney's fees, fines, loss of pay, sanctions, and jail time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're about to get started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our final panel of day one of the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Conference. And just as we started strong and we kept the energy going, we're going to finish just as strong and even stronger. We have quite the distinguished panel uh, to close out the day. And so no matter where you fall on the partnership spectrum, whether it's public, private, academia, international partners, we're all dealing with the topic of this next panel, which is law and policy challenges amidst global competition. So it's my distinct honor to introduce our moderator, Colonel Retired Gary Korn. He's currently the director of the Technology, Law, and Security Program at American University, Washington College of Law here in D.C. And he's also an adjunct professor of cyber and national security law and the law of armed conflict at American University Washington College of Law. And close to our heart, he is a distinguished alum of the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Office. His final five years on active duty, he served as a staff judge advocate with the general counsel here at U.S. Cyber Command. So, sir, over to you. Thank you for keeping that short. Um, 
So before I before I launch into the the panel proper, um, I mean I've said this privately, but having been involved in this conference a time or two in the past, like kudos to you and the team, Pete, um, elevating it every time. This is pretty amazing. Now it's online and people are viewing. So you know there's somebody out there drawing a a mustache on me out on some screen right now or something. That's great. Um, and I'm, I'm going to use my laptop, different than other people with their hand notes, because I want to make sure that um, the Chinese are able to collect everything <laughs> on me during this, this presentation. But we are very lucky. We'll come back to the, the title of the, of the panel in a minute, but let me first introduce the great lineup of speakers that we have, um, starting at the, at the far end, Carrie Cordero, Robert M. Gates, Senior Fellow and General Counsel at the Center for a New American security at CNAS, um, also an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown, and a frequent appearer on CNN as an analyst. Um, so you may recognize her from seeing her on CNN from a time or two, but um, consistent across the, the, the panel, we have folks who have deep experience in both the private sector in different capacities and in government and public sector. So Carrie served many years um, including as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, Senior Associate General Counsel at the Office of ODNI, Office at ODNI, and Attorney Advisor at the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, has been working intel and national security law issues for a long time and brings a wealth of experience. Next, we have Ben Powell, was able to get through the gate after a push or two, so thank you for fighting your way through that. Um, even with Air Force pedigree, <laughs> and a blue suit. They, they gave you a hard time. Um, ben is the, a partner and co-chair of cybersecurity and privacy practice at Wil Wilmer Hale, um, of, of one of the most well-renowned and, and respected attorneys in the space of cybersecurity, national security law in the private sector for a number of years. But um, Ben was also the first, I believe, correct? Uh, general counsel uh, at ODNI, helped stand up ODNI in the, in the early days. And he also served as a special assistant to the president and associate White House counsel. He was an Air Force officer, as I mentioned, um, and did work at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Again, um, another uh, with deep, deep experience in, in the national security law space uh, over time. So we get both hats to bring to this conversation, which is great. Um, and then Alyssa Starzak, um, I think the first time we met Alyssa, I don't know whether it was when you were at DOD General Counsel, maybe we bumped into each other, but um, the Army TJAG now, Joe Berger, um, reached out to me when I was the SJ Cyber Command and said, hey, can you come to me with a meeting with Army General Counsel? Because the he was the SJ at Army Cyber Command, and they were trying to do some reforce allocation or something, and he brought me into a, a knife fight that I lost. So, um, but anyway, that was a good introduction, Alyssa, but we've made peace ever since. No, um, so she is the Vice President, Deputy Chief Legal Officer, and Global Head of Public po Policy at Cloudflare, uh, a company that most of you should recognize, a cloud connectivity company, on a mission to help build a better internet. That's great, I like that. Um, but as I, as I mentioned previously, um, plenty of time in government as uh, the 21st General Counsel of the Army, um, also at DOD General Counsel's office, worked on the Senate as well on the Hill. Yeah, so um, we, are, we are lucky to have this lineup to talk about a topic that as we did our due diligence and got together yesterday to plan, I think we all realized we weren't sure what the topic is. So this should be good. Um, law and policy challenges amidst global competition. Um, so we had a lot of ideas kicking around and I think we'll be able to cover most if not all of them. I will say, um, I'll give you a signal. We're not gonna wait to the last five or 10 minutes for, for questions. Let's get a hot bench going today. Let's get interaction. We'll, I'll, I'll draw questions in earlier, hopefully. Um, but part of it really was a, a uh, thinking through what did we mean by this? So we, this is like Pete really instituting mission command and giving me very general guidance, 
seize the initiative, et cetera. So uh, we, have, we have wide latitude. But we know that we've been in, in the DOD circles and the national security circles for the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years. The terminology pivots and, and uh, you know, great power competition, uh, move to strategic competition in the current administration. That could be the setting of this discussion. It's something, I think, broader. There's, there's we talked yesterday, global competition. So I, I guess um, my first question for, for each of you, um, and, and we can start with Alyssa and work our way down, what do you take to be this topic and, and the challenges that are presented currently um, in, amidst global competition? Um, so we did have a very lively conversation about global competition, and uh, I think Gary started with me um, probably because uh, my view is sort of a military one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually involved in the National Defense Strategy Commission, um, and so we've been talking a lot about what competition means um, and what, what it actually looks like globally, and particularly uh, conflict with China potentially down the road, what that would mean. Um, so I kind of turned to that one. Um, and I, I think um, from a practical standpoint, when we think about that, one of the, the pieces that comes from a private sector standpoint is really thinking about the role of technology um, in that conflict. Um, and when you get into the world of, of policy and legal challenges, what is the barrier? You know, if we want to harness private industry um, and private technology companies in particular in a bigger, um, you know, all of nation fight or all of society fight, um, if that's where we end up going, what does that look like and what are the barriers that we see? So that was how I saw the conversation about what global competition is. And we can talk a lot about that because there are a lot of barriers right now. Um, there are barriers inside the US about when we have conflicting ideas about re what regulations are gonna do and what that means for industry and what the effect is. There are international barriers um, when we have conflicts in regulatory uh, environments uh, and different views um, and lack of coordination. Um, and then just generally a lack of understanding between, um, between industry and, uh, and government in general. So I think there's a lot we can talk about today. I'm actually gonna keep it short, um, at least from an initial comment, because I, think, I, think, I tend to think particularly at the end of the day, um, the more we can have interaction, the better off you will all be and the more awake you will all be at the end. Hear, hear. Um, I, but before I turn to you, Ben, I, I want to say um, I, I asked ChatGPT what the legal and policy challenges are. And ChatGPT told me there's just two. I won't tell you which ones, but it's just a two. But Ben um, had a very long list of challenges, which confirmed for me that ChatGPT is kind of stupid because Ben's really smart. So I, I defer to Ben. Uh, ben, what do you think the... the the challenges are and how we frame this question or this panel. So I'm smarter than a machine that is prone to psychopathic hallucinations. So thank you, <laughs> Gary, for that compliment here at the end of the day, um, recalls of some of our, uh, our, our, our past interactions. I first met Alyssa at an intelligence oversight hearing. Um, none of you will remember, but there were a few, con there were a few <laughs> controversies after 9-11 related to signals intelligence related to a variety of intelligence operations around the world, but uh, maybe that predated a number of people and you haven't heard about any of that. But um, um, yeah, uh, the first month I took over the, as DNI general counsel, uh, just one, I'll just tell one, one more story. I think we testified, uh, General Hayden and I, I believe we testified for 12 hours straight between the, uh, between the House and Senate. So uh, that was my first month introduction to the, to the job. Um, and I was testifying about a number of programs which I had nothing to do with and had to come up to speed and testify extensively on. So it was a, quite, a, quite, a, quite a time of it, to put it mildly. But getting to the topic, and happy to take any questions on this, I think uh, it's exactly what Alyssa said. And we are also, in many ways, moving towards a more segmented world in a world that, frankly, threatens the U.S. home field advantage that we have in IT and technology, that's going to be critical to both, you know, great power competition and, it, and asymmetrical warfare. So when I look across the landscape, and we all live through the world about an internet of no boundaries and a boundaryless uh, flow of data, of course, we've moved to a very different place right now, and the velocity of that segmentation is growing. So when you look at how long it took Europe to come up with their uh, GDPR, their privacy law, 
um, many years, many struggles over that. They enacted their EU AI privacy law here you know, at light speed in six months. There's going to be more development for that. It has to go to the countries and those types of things. But you, you just look at this velocity that is happening. When you look at the requirements for data localization, uh, the inefficiencies that that creates, and frankly, the looming national security challenges that are in the background that come out of those laws. And of course, now many countries enacting both inbound investment regimes similar to our committee on foreign investment in the United States, which now looks at things like data sets and other things when it was traditionally many years ago, really about what I would call core defense technologies all across the board and all across the landscape you see countries uh, becoming more segmented when it comes to IT, when it comes to infrastructure, and of course everyone is competing uh, on, on artificial intelligence and just what is that gonna mean for the United States and these technologies that we need uh, to, to stay in the forefront of. Some of these will be advantageous to us uh, because some countries will essentially remove themselves uh, from, the, uh, from the competition with uh, stringent localization. But in other places, really, uh, it will hobble us to the extent uh, that it will hurt our IT industry to, to compete on the global stage. So very much when I look at this, a, um, you know, a segmented world that we're moving to and the challenges that that's going to bring. Definitely some things to follow up on there. Um, but Carrie? So thank you, um, Gary. It's so nice to be uh, with Alyssa and Ben and Gary, of course, and thanks to Sabrecom for, um, for hosting me again today. It's amazing to return here after um, many years and being at some of the original conferences that uh, Gary had first put together um, and see how this community has grown and how this conference has grown. So it's really an honor to, to be with you guys here today. Um, so I think the common theme that you're going to hear from all of us today um, focuses on the issue of technology in particular. It's not the only issue of uh, strategic competition or global competition, um, but it is a big one. And I think it, it is a common trend um, from both the government perspective and through the private sector perspective. It's certainly um, the issue that is one that uh, me and my colleagues at the Center for New American Security are thinking about every single day, all the time, because it goes through um, all of our different regions of expertise um, and engagement. The way that, um, that I, you know, might tee up in terms of thinking about sort of three different aspects um, of how the strategic competition is centered on the technology sector comes down to these. So one is thinking about policies that promote the development of the technology. So we have to continue to think about ways that our laws and our legal framework is facilitating the development of the technologies, particularly here in the United States. A number of my colleagues, um, both in our energy economics program and in our technology and national security program at CNS, have done work on the need for an industrial policy for the United States. And part of that centers on the fact that we haven't had that kind of policy, that it needs to take into account the technology aspects, and it needs to take into account how you develop those with uh, some of our close international partners. So f continuing to have policies that promote the development of those technologies. The second is then facilitating access for the national security community, for the defense community, facilitating access to those communities, um, to those technologies, excuse me. And uh, I think we heard in one of the earlier panels issues regarding the difficulties in getting innovative technologies into the hands of those who are trying to compete the mission. Um, what I would observe is that this is not just a defense, it's not just a cybercom issue, it's not just a defense department issue. Um, I sit on the Homeland Security Advisory Council, and one of the reports that we did over the course of the last year was focused on the Homeland Security Technology and Innovation uh, Network and thinking about how to get the new technologies that are being developed by American companies, uh, particularly from the startup community, into the hands of the Homeland Security operators. And what we quickly found was that it, the issues that they're dealing with in the Homeland Security community are very similar to issues that the Defense Department has been working through for many, many years. So getting the innovation into the hands of um, the agencies and 
uh, mission-focused organizations that need them is a constant challenge on the government side. And then third um, area that I would tee up that I, I think all of us have um, thoughts about is then the need to protect information, data, um, both from the data perspective and users. And this is where I think we'll get into some of the issues that are you know, top of mind in terms of those who are engaged in the cybersecurity mission, um, as well as some of the, the ancillary issues that are now in our information environment space. So you, you use a phrase in there, the need for industrial policy. Um, that, in some circles, is anathema, right? That is, that'll, and that seems to be part of how, how things are shifting and changing um, especially in the technology space, as you say, uh, and recognition of vulnerabilities that we have at a, at a national strategic level because of supply chain issues. You talk about chips. Uh, you talk about data issues um, and the development of AI, all these things. Where do you see this headed from a policy perspective? Um, and that's for you know, any and all of you. Um, kind of re-embracing or rethinking about what, what is generally termed industrial policy and maybe explain for the audience. Sure, so, um, so I would, what I'm thinking about is in terms of um, some of the work that my colleagues have done at uh, CNAS where the fact that we haven't had, obviously, you know, it would be a major shift to move to that, um, to move to that construct, um, however, there is um, a couple reports that I would uh, sort of commend to the audience. One is called Lighting the Path, and one is called Rebuild, a Toolkit for a New American Industrial Policy. And the reason for it is it, it relates to some of the, the prior issues that we were discussing in the role of the private sector, um, which is that outside of a policy framework, um, companies, including those that are privately held, um, are going to get out in front of issues that are in conflict zones in the defense space. And the integration of some of the technology issues in particular, it's, it's all just much more interconnected now. And so the absence of a policy framework, what you're then doing is you're leaving individual companies to engage in these world events, in these geopolitical events, in a way that perhaps they haven't uh, before. So I'll start there and hopefully that'll give us enough to. I actually, can I, I, I want to follow on that. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth actually um, thinking about the world that we're in now and how we ended up here. Um, because it actually goes into some of Ben's comments and I think Carrie's as well, right? If you think about how the internet started, and I think there was a, one of the panels this morning kind of talked a little bit about it. You know, the, the US started the internet um, from a practical standpoint um, through DARPA, uh, you know, the, 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 all of the things that came up, came up because the US had an idea of how things should get built. Um, and a lot of the ideas that sort of come in from the internet standpoint are all US oriented, this idea of interconnected networks, um, the idea that we can all be connected, it can, things can go across borders, big concepts. Um, and the things that then, that then led to, um, it, it sort of interrelated with things like um, globalization, um, which then allowed for sort of diversity of supply chain across lots of different countries. Um, and we're now in this period where people are starting to rethink those big ideas. And I think you're seeing the tension with things like industrial policy, which was always an outcome because it was not consistent with that idea of big um, globalization and how do we think about this big openness, um, interconnectedness, how do we work through that? Um, and you're also seeing it in lots of other countries who are saying, hey, I'm worried about my own sovereignty. Go away, US. We don't want you. We want to localize our stuff. We don't want you to have access to it. And, and so you're, you're seeing this tension um, between a lot of those pieces. I think from the private sector side, the thing that we worry about um, that is that the US puts pressure from the regulatory and policy side in a way that encourages that even more, that ultimately decreases the US advantage. Because the thing that gave us that long-term path from a US standpoint of interconnected networks and an internet and, the, and private industry that, that we're building for the world was a remarkable amount of power and, and access and um, just ability to control things. And I think as we start press, putting pressure on that and separating and saying, no, 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 we don't want to be part of the world, we're going to take away that long-term influence. And so we have to think about that balance in pretty significant ways because I think it will, um, it, it actually is kind of where we're moving and we're, we're not, we're kind of moving in fits and starts. No one really has quite figured that out yet. 
a little bit um, to be determined on where we go with industrial policy. Obviously, we have the CHIPS Act, which is a massive amount of funding uh, that's supporting uh, the development of, of semiconductor manufacturing here in a number of places in the United States, and we'll see where where that goes. Beyond that, we don't have a lot of additional industrial policy things of the of the size of the of the CHIPS Act. What we do have, and probably many people are more familiar with it than I am in this room, but how much COVID supercharged the supply chain discussion, not just on what we learned about protective equipment that we never thought of, uh, vaccine precursor chemicals and all of those types of things and where things were really made in the world. We then had Ukraine, of course, um, adding essentially turbocharging that when we discovered, wow, we didn't realize this depended on some small manufacturers in Missouri. We had no idea at the end of this long supply chain. So seeing where we go with those kinds of investments. Uh, and of course, we're seeing that across the, the IT and electronics supply chain. And we see that all the time in what the United States is doing with investment reviews and how rigorous uh, those have become largely with very good reason, of course, right? Because we're looking at the, trying to see, are there hidden hands of adversaries where it's going to give them access in ways that are going to you know, endanger the national security of the country? Or is it going to give them access to uh, the supply chain in a way that we're going to become dependent? And, and frankly, I think it was a wake-up call to many people as a result of both COVID and what we've seen in Ukraine as we try to ramp up production and manufacturing and other things, just how difficult that is and how, you know, what Alyssa had said, how interdependent we've come. And that seems to apply across the board, not just to, you know, things in the, in the COVID world, but very much in the IT infrastructure world, what we see when we see the concentration in Taiwan and what would happen there in a higher end uh, uh, conflict. And the fact of the matter is, is we're still very dependent um, for a number of very important components on people who may not have the U.S. best interests in heart or even be allies of the United States. So I think from an industrial policy and a military policy, we're going to have to continue to think through that and manage those relationships. Uh, clearly, a complete cutoff would, uh, would be very problematic. Um, and so how we manage that has really been, I think, the, the question that everyone is grappling with. Yeah, I mean, it's manifested in, in different ways. The discussions, the, the decoupling discussion re regarding China, which I, I think is Pollyannish. I mean, at best, and I think to your point, you're talking about recoupling in a way. You, there's, the decoupling is probably not possible. Um, but, but with these um, interconnected touch points, you do have vulnerabilities. Uh, it's a, somebody had a question this morning, I think, you know, reaching back to the original sort of premises of the creation of the internet, to your earlier point, um, that there were a lot of, um, it, it was going to be a, a, a good for all, right? It, it ignored a lot of the potential harms that we've seen that are also involved and flow from that. Um, and I was sifting around through some things last night and I see an article um, around internet governance on a, on a Georgia Tech website, it's a pretty good website, but you know, is the United States becoming China, right? So to your point of um, segmentation and fragmentation, et cetera, um, and they were making points about CFIUS and other things, what if China were to do to US companies? I think they're already doing it, um, but this all manifests in, in, in different ways, the same sort of recycling discussion. How do we manage these relationships? And I'm going to bring it to the theme of the, the conference, the power of partnerships. Well, part of those partnerships, um, as stressed in all sorts of strategic documents, is international partners and partnerships. How do we, how do we manage that um, in this amidst global competition? Really good example in the, the panel earlier um, from the utility company talking about uh, a partially owned Canadian company because 
I think those of us in the national security space, it's, there's very bright lines when it comes to adversary countries. And then there's pretty clear lines when it comes to our closest partners. But there might be a range of potential international partners that are in between, there's a, there's a big range that is between our, our clear adversaries and our very, very closest partners that we still need to be uh, doing more to figure out how to work with them, partner with them, particularly in the global technology space that are neither in, not in either of those two categories. And um, I think that's where sort of the, the modernization of some of the CFIUS related, the, the foreign investment conversation, those pieces come into play even more in terms of thinking about our global partnerships when it comes to those countries that are neither uh, the very clear adversaries nor the, 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 our, our very, very closest allies and partners. Um, I, I think from, a, from, this, the, from the role of a private company, I think people might be surprised uh, to understand how much of our day-to-day -day on the policy and legal side has nothing to do with the U.S. or where the U.S. is in conflict. So the number of times we have to deal with data protection authorities in Europe um, because they're worried about the U.S. government accessing uh, data, <laughs> which should be a, a, something that we can solve, and thankfully, yes, US, EU, EU, U.S. data privacy framework, yes, fantastic. Um, but the number of things like that, where really we're talking about people who are close allies, um, and yet we're still in conflict with them from, a, from, the, from the private company side, because two governments haven't talked, um, feels really challenging. Um, and it's, it's really hard from a company standpoint to manage that relationship and say, no, don't worry about the US. No, we're not going to respond to the US when they ask for something. That sort of puts companies in a really challenging position. Um, but if you want to do business as a multinational company, you have to understand the role of those countries. And again, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about allies. I'm not talking about hostile countries. I'm talking about allies. And so understanding those partnerships and relationships where there are potentially conflicts um, and trying to work them out from the government side, I think, is, is something that doesn't happen enough. Um, and often, um, I think when we interact with the U.S. government, the, the number of people who don't process that there are other laws out there that apply to, to multinational companies is shocking, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations that we've had where people don't understand, why don't you just let, you, let us in your networks? Well, because that would cause us problems, right? I mean, the, the number of, of conversations that we have on that point, um, again, because of allies, um, is, is, is really significant. Um, I will also say, um, I think that one of the things that we see is trying to figure out what is being advocated for um, in, in sort of a policy positioning standpoint. So if you have um, a, somebody who is sort of um, on the border, uh, they're neither close ally, as Carrie said, but they're, nor are they adversary, full adversary. What are you asking them to do from a legal standpoint? Are you, um, when they put a law in place on data localization or on uh, restrictions around sovereignty, where is the U.S.? Um, what is the U.S. saying? Um, what, what is the position of the U.S.? Um, how do you think about those roles? Um, I think we often see the U.S. absent in those conversations um, or in other conversations where the U.S. I think could play a, a much more significant role in sort of shaping global conversations and global norms. Yeah, I would just say, you know, there's when we talk about the competition and following on what Alyssa said about not just our adversaries, but those allies uh, and other related countries, you know, there's, um, everyone wants Silicon Valley. Everyone wants the dynamism and the innovation that the tech sector has produced in the United States and all of the things that it has done, you know, across the board, what we've done in terms of cloud, what we're doing in terms of AI. Of course, everyone's talking about quantum and, and, uh, whatever the next thing is on the horizon. Um, but it is interesting because a lot of those countries have taken a very heavy-handed regulatory approach or an exclusionary approach around data localization, uh, trying to, uh, in some cases, hobble uh, American companies and make it more difficult to operate. Um, we can have a whole separate panel on whether that simply reflects different values across different countries and where they place, the, uh, place their emphasis on things like uh, competition policy, privacy, and other things, or whether they're trying to protect uh, local industries and create their own Silicon Valley. 
Um, I have some personal views about, you know, good luck with heavy handed regulation somehow magically creating your own Silicon Valley. Um, so we'll we'll just see where that where that comes out. But my uh, I guess I'd just say good luck to some of those countries because I don't really see that innovation and dynamism uh, being created. But I do see a lot of jobs for um, bureaucrats being created. So, um, you know, we'll just see where that competition policy goes in the next a uh, decade uh, as we accelerate the the innovations in the, in the cyberspace world, in AI, in quantum, across the technological board, on on networking, on data. So, you know, there's just going to be a competition in these models. Um, I don't know that the United States is going to join in that join in that competition, um, and we certainly hope that you know we we you know keep encouraging the innovation and the things that have frankly uh, provided a tremendous home field advantage to the United States, you know, including our defense industrial base, really, to the kinds of things that you're, you're operating, the kinds of things that you're dealing with, of course, are just amazing. And a lot of that comes out of our tech sector at, at bottom uh, in terms of producing the software and hardware that is the foundation for a lot of the you know, incredible weapon systems that, frankly, the world wants right now, right? And, uh, is, is trying to get their hands on. Yeah, I think um, I think it's with respect to the new EU AI Act, right? The that they've there's a category of social media platforms of a certain size. It's a it's a digital services digital act, market. yes, markets act. One of those many regulatory <laughs> EU things. Hey, very very busy, busy. Very busy. But you know, if you look down the list of companies that they've identified as fitting in the category of being covered, I think like 80 to 90 percent of them are U.S. companies. Um, if Stuart Baker were here, he'd probably be a little less restrained. I've heard him say it's, it's, this is just uh, technological imperialism from <laughs> from Europe. But um, it, it is part of a we were talking yesterday, I think behind all this, there is a very live discussion about um, in strategic competition, shall we say, ideological competition. Where are we with all of this? And who's agitating to uh, you know, bring forth their own version of norms in, dig in, in internet governance, in uh, you know, the, the space of content moderation, which fits underneath that. Uh, you look at Russia, I you know, mentioned yesterday in, in the first committee of the UN pushing for a cybercrime convention, which it, when you start peeling it away is essentially trying to define a whole bunch of information-based activity as criminal because it's being done on the internet. Therefore, it's cybercrime. Um, and we can imagine whose ends that serve. H how do we, how do we do a better job of partnering internationally um, to pierce through this? And it's, we would think that the Europeans would be our best partners. Um, and yet they're not necessarily our best partners. And China, who we could say is a divine adversary, we have entanglements <laughs> that are also complicating how we approach this. So, uh, I'm actually going to start on some of the EU things because I think they reflect a little bit about what's happening in the US as well. So the Digital Markets Act is essentially competition related. Um, and if you look at what's happening in the US on competition policy, it's actually not that different. Um, it, it, there is some of the same incentives that are um, pushing the Europeans are also pushing US policy um, on, in different areas. I think the challenge, honestly, from a regulatory standpoint, is that there are lots of different interests, and we see this across the board. Even in the US, you have lots of different things pushing different ways from a policy standpoint. So it's not all in one direction. It's not all, um, we're not all in the, in the strategic competition. Um, there are lots of other interests at play. Um, and so how do you put those together into a coherent policy that does reflect the environment that we're in um, and that sort of anticipates the longer term uh, goals that we're trying to find? It's really hard is just the bottom line. And digital policy is hard. Um, I, I, I think the thing that's happening on the international stage, to your point about allies, um, so again, going back to the foundation of the, of the internet, um, one of the, the governance structures of the internet are multi-stakeholder. Um, and that sounds really weird in a, in a military environment, but the idea that um, all sorts of people come together and make decisions about how the internet is run, that is 
that actually is what happens, right? <laughs> From a practical standpoint, that's how protocols work. That's why we have some of the, the, the ways that we have now um, for, for how those things operate. Um, right now in the international environment, those are, things are being reconsidered. Um, so uh, the, you know, we're, we're at a point where um, some of those internet governance questions are coming up. Um, and of course, that's opportunity for a country that may, for countries that may want to rethink those models. Um, and so the challenge, I think, when you have a very complicated policy environment and regulatory environment and you have lots of different um, goals from, from, a, from a single government is that it's very hard to figure out what your policy position is when you get into those conversations. So when you're talking about something like the Global Digital Compact, right, um, which is uh, you know, currently under negotiation, or the Cybercrime uh, Convention, what are we trying to do as a U.S. government? Um, I think those are, again, we don't, we don't always have one voice, and that means if we don't have one voice, how do we rally our, our allies around the same set of principles? It's really hard. I guess one way I would think about this is that, from my perspective, one of the challenges is that the United States still has not been able to settle on an agreed upon way that we categorize the technology companies, the technology platforms in particular, um, in a legal framework. Um, and what I mean by that is, so there's one theory out there that, that some of the technology platforms basically function like utilities. And you can make that argument um, when you think about just the way that we need to use them on a daily basis. I mean, there's no aspect of life that you can go through from morning until night that in some way doesn't rely, whether it's at work, at home, your social things, the stuff you do with your kids, everything. There's, there's no aspect of our life that doesn't rely on the uh, infrastructure, the technology infrastructure and the digital infrastructure. So from that perspective, it sort of sounds utility like and then there's other arguments out there that say well no particularly when it comes to communications platforms you know they're performing a function that's more like a news organization and so we have like these different old ways of thinking about um different industries and the way that the technology sector has evolved is just simply something different and our the United, when I say our, the United States' lack of ability to sort of come up with a new framework that actually fits and isn't trying to fit these companies into an old legal framework that isn't applicable to the way that they conduct their work and the way that they operate in our lives has then left us having to respond and be reactive to, for example, what the Europeans have done, where they said, okay, you're not going to create a framework, you're not going to put any... Um, regulations in place, then we're going to do it and we're going to impose it on you. And that has placed U.S. industry in a really difficult position. Well, and to some degree, uh, in, in very different, uh, with very different approaches. If we think content moderation, for example, and Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act here is almost entirely the opposite of what we see happening in Europe now um, and their willingness to sort of step in and place these requirements on uh, social media platforms and, uh, and others for content moderation. Um, so it, it is it is challenging to think about how we how we get on common footing. <laughs> so as companies in the private sector, um, I remember talking to um, I think it was Kristen Goodwin at, at Microsoft several years back. Uh, you know, and similar conversation on the sidebar, and it was. You know, you have to understand that, you know, X percentage of our customer base is outside the United States, which puts a lot of pressure even on the U.S. companies. And if you're feeling that the U.S. government is not engaging, I don't know, do we have anybody from state here? Oh, hello. So they may, they may have a different sense of whether we're, we're engaging. If, but at, what, what's the level of interaction between companies and the government to convey these concerns and say, you know, how can we get on the same page? And oh, by the way, does the company really want to be on the same page as the U.S. government because of the competing interests that the companies have? Yeah, I would say there's a lot of engagement. Um, the, the question is, is really <clears throat> um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, really the, is the U.S. able to engage and influence it? So obviously a lot of concern, uh, I think, in the U.S. about 
about these issues, a lot of engagement, but um, Alyssa will have a little bit, uh, be interested in Alyssa's perspective, but I think for a lot of companies, they're somewhat on their own <clears throat> in engaging in Europe and other places. Yes, you know, the U.S. is able to support it, but, um, you know, I think it's um, not the power of the voice that it once was. Uh, you know, we, I think some of the challenges are the, um, it, it's not always clear what the U.S. message is. And I think that's not, that's not a, <laughs> that's from a, from, from the government perspective, that's a little bit of an interagency coordination problem. <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, when you're looking at it from the private sector side, um, this is going to be, again, kind of anathema to the military side of the world, but the private companies look at it and say, they pulled out of WTO, what? Um, and, and all of these messages about the interconnected, um, you know, interconnected trade and globalization, why would they do that? We had these great messages in, you know, in APAC or um, in, you know, in Asia Pacific. Um, what, how, what does this look like for us? And so you have, you have this lack of understanding, I think, from a company side about um, that the U.S. is in a the U.S. government isn't a monolith, um, and you have a lot of different voices and a lot of different influences. Um, and but the, the company doesn't see that; they just see that the U.S. isn't sort of supporting their commercial interests or supporting them as businesses. Um, and that that raises challenges, I think, um, longer term. I, I think for folks in companies who have been in government, you can kind of see what's happening. You can try to explain it, um, but it, I think it's still hard to understand. You know, if you're at a large company, we're we're not a huge company; we're a small company. But if you're at a large company. Um, and you're looking out and saying, why isn't the government supporting me um, in the competition world? Um, why don't they want me to stay together uh, in, because I am a force against um, in the global competition, right? Um, and I think that's confusing to a lot of people. But again, that's that re reflection of a lot of different values um, that, that sort of get swept in. But I think that it's the interagency. It's, it's, again, kind of an interagency problem. I would, not, I would not blame a single actor in the U.S. government. I think that we don't always have clear... Uh, messaging across um, across different agencies. We're not always synchronized across the interagency. I know you're shocked. Huh? I'm shocked. What? Everyone in the room is shocked. Okay, so I want to scan for questions from the audience. I think you should all be thinking too a little bit. We have a lot of people in uniform in the room. That's our primary audience here. I can't talk to um, who's watching from the outside, um, from what countries. But certainly, why does why does some of this matter? You know, you're, you're in your fighting position, looking over the edge of your, your foxhole. Why does this broader discussion matter to DOD or from a national security perspective? You might think about that. I can put it to the, the panelists because no one's raising their hands with questions. I'll just say following on Alyssa's point, um, you know, we don't really, we recoil as a government from having national champions, right? We, we, we we don't have a national champion unlike some other countries who very much promote a certain area. So that, and there's a lot of good reasons for that, but it can affect us in terms of that international, that international, that international discussion, particularly when you have countries that look and say, you know, time and time again, the power of American innovation American technology, um, kind of the freedom to innovate that the that the U.S. has encouraged is just a for some of those countries that very diff they speak a very different language, um, and particularly today in the world of world world of privacy and other things that you're seeing as they kind of for each new technology are you know kind of racing ahead to regulate it right our our traditional model has been let us see what develops here. Uh, and then try to be a little bit slower and smarter, hopefully, about um, uh, regulation. And, and so right now you're seeing in Europe and other countries a kind of like a new technology. Let's race to regulate it because we missed the boat on the last technology. Um, you know, I, as you could tell, I'm a little bit skeptical of that approach. Um, and it results, I think, in some cases of some companies saying we're simply not going to operate in that country until we get a, a clearer regulatory framework. Um, you know, we'll see that may in some cases redound to our benefit, frankly, from a technological superiority standpoint to the extent countries cut them off from that innovation. But we're going to see what, what happens.
So how do you, how do you see, um, right, obviously there is that tension, that tension between the push for innovation, um, giving an environment, regulatory and otherwise, that, that, that uh, favors innovation, et cetera. Um, are, are we in a little bit of a Thucydian trap race? You know, we're, we're in an AI race with a primary competitor. Um, and how do we manage that question on, on, you know, it's on everybody's plate these days, AI and ones that taken over the world. But um, we're seeing more certainly in its executive order. It's, it's not to the point of legislation like in, in Europe. Um, but how do we manage that, that balance? You need to ask questions, folks, because now we're in talking about AI, and that's all your hey. fault. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I will say, um, I, you, somebody gave an example at, a, um, at an event I was on a, a few weeks ago um, on AI that I, th that I thought was actually really interesting as we think about AI regulation. Um, they talked about AI as a triangle, the sort of considerations. Um, you, have, uh, you have safety, security, and supremacy um, all at different points of the triangle and all pulling in different directions. So, you know, the, the reality to, to Gary's question is as you think about AI, the more controls you add, the, the slower that you are going to go, of course. Um, that's true from both the security side and the safety side, which are different. Um, right, so thinking about the protection of, of an AI system just in general, what kind of controls do you put on it, um, and then thinking about the outputs on the safety side. Um, I think I think the goal is to come up with not putting any of those at one point um, and saying this is absolutely, we need to go as fast as possible. Clearly, um, I think we've learned that sometimes you do want controls on technology. I think most co companies have learned that too. Um, but you then have to think about how you do that responsibly um, and, and still move the ball forward um, across all of them. But I think that I thought that was a really kind of interesting model to think about those pieces as being intention. I Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I'm wondering on this, like at a, glo at a global context, like this, this global competition frame, there seems to almost be a global paradox where our global politics and our global reality are kind of different. And what do I mean by that? Where regionalism, nationalism, industrial policy are taking hold simultaneous to our economies and our people becoming more and more connected. And so as you advise with, and I'll make this more tangible, last year, you know, we had our most productive trade year with China, simultaneous to probably our tensions being at their highest with between our governments. So at that global level or advising through that it seemingly paradox, how do you think through that or what advice do you have for wrestling through that for us? Start off a little bit. I mean, I think the, the answer is very different if we're thinking, I think part of it depends on are we thinking about this from a, from a US government from a defense standpoint or are you thinking about it from the private sector standpoint? Because I think the answer to those are gonna be very, very different. Um, on the on the economic side of it, I mean, I think, and that's why there's there's a difficulty in terms of the tensions within U.S. policy making right now, right? Because on one hand, um, we have a certain strand of our politics that is um, very aggressively treating China as an adversary and wants all U.S. policy from from national security policy down to economic policy to be along that line, and on the other hand, we have the the private sector or commercial side of things that has markets. And so that that tension is is continuing. And I don't know that we ever get to a place where one is going to um, uh, outweigh the other. I think we're continuing to navigate that line unless there, unless there is some acute sort of military catalyst that then changes the, the balance. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're the country's trying to manage through it right on a on a on a category basis right so we the 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 new regulations around critical technology lists and other things and how that infects investment and essentially the government saying that in these areas right on this list of technologies on this locations we're going to have a um, very heavy burden to allow you to invest in that kind of technology and those kinds of companies. And we're also gonna restrict exports 
to you um, in that area, right? And that places a lot of tension on it because this, essentially their five and 10 year plan identifies, guess what? Many of those critical, critical technologies as what they are saying are their priorities. And at the same time, there's a lot of things not on that list um, where you continue to have interdependencies. And of course we still have interdependencies for things on that list. And the government's trying, you know, from our perspective, in the private sector, the government's trying to manage through those interdependencies where, you know, it's still on that critical technology list. But how do we, how do we manage through that, right? It, uh, uh, in, in kind of manage the tensions in the adversarial relationship. But as you said, it's still a very large relationship. It's still a very large um, um, trade flow. So we've tried to, you know. It seems like now our our policy is to look very much at those critical technologies and have an ever lengthening list in ways that we didn't before, right? I mean, it's not new, right? Obviously, things you know, submarine propeller technology and all the defense things that were on there. But now you look at that list and it's you know data sets on more than a million Americans and things that are a long way away from anything you saw for the past. 30 years, and when you look at, you know, bio and other, other technologies. So it's exactly what you outlined. Um, right now, I think we're trying to manage through it on a, on a categorization basis, right? It says if you're in these areas, it's going to be okay, um, and we want investment, and we want to continue the trade flows. But when you're getting into a lot of the things that you deal with here in terms of cyberspace, networking, high-end software, high-end hardware, high-end processing, uh, we're going to have a more restrictive environment and, you know, potentially some, some decoupling uh, in those areas. But that's obviously not the most stable place to be. So we're going to continue to see these flare-ups. We're going to continue to be on this, this roller coaster, I think. So I think we have the Grim Reaper standing up there ready to cut us off. So that's why I'm here. Um, Gary, Ben, Alessa, Sir, Gary, thank you so much for that incredibly insightful and wide-ranging conversation. Despite some initial questions about the original topic, I couldn't think of a better way to end day one. So before we deliver a raucous round of applause for our incredible panel, while I've got you, three quick announcements for tomorrow. So one, we'll start back here tomorrow at 8.45 with administrative announcements. Two, we're going to start day two with the National Cyber Director, uh, Mr. Harry Coker. And then three, just a reminder about our no host social tomorrow at 445 at the golf club, at the golf course. Final thing, please grab your trash, clean up your area, take it out. So with that, thank you for a wonderful day one to our streamers, to everyone here, and to our panel. Thank you so much. The Cyber National Mission Force, or CNMF, is a joint command available to U.S. Cyber Command to respond to its toughest challenges. 2024 marks the 10-year anniversary of the CNMF. U.S. Cyber Command established CNMF in 2014, recognizing the need for a force agile enough to respond to any crisis at any time, composed of highly trained and qualified cyber operators drawn from across the services. Today, the CNMF is composed of 39 joint cyber teams organized across six task forces, consisting of soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardmen, guardians, and NSA, Air Force, and DIA civilians. CNMF's mission is to plan, direct, and synchronize full-spectrum cyberspace operations to deter, disrupt, and if necessary, defeat adversary cyber and malign influence actors. The CNMF conducts the full spectrum of cyberspace operations, consisting of offensive, defensive, and information operations. CNMF supports U.S. Cyber Command and national priorities such as election defense, counter ransomware, global cyber security threat hunt operations, and other operations of national importance. CNMF works closely with other partners in the U.S. government. The CNMF routinely works with the FBI, DHS, NSA, and others to defend the nation. These partnerships are critical for this vital mission to defend the homeland. 
Each agency possesses differing authorities and capabilities. The ability to quickly share information, to leverage the proper authorities at the appropriate time, secures the nation and keeps our adversaries off guard, engaging them as far forward in cyberspace outside the United States. The CNMF is on the cutting edge of legal operations in the cyber domain. Since its inception, CNMF continues to drive the evolution of cyber operations. There has never been a better time to join the CNMF legal team. The Office of the Staff Judge Advocate, or OSJA, conducts the full range of legal operations, primarily focused on operational law. However, the office continues to provide advice across the legal disciplines. Individuals that join the CNMF OSJA must have a strong background in fiscal law, administrative law, international law, military justice, legal assistance, and of course operational law. The CNMF needs attorneys that are creative enough to link the various authorities together and present creative solutions to our clients. As a plank holder in the CNMF OSJA, you will have an opportunity to advise on unique and novel issues that have a direct impact on national events. There are few other organizations in the government where you will be exposed to the type of issues that we see on a daily basis. If you are a motivated legal professional that can work independently with little guidance, we would love for you to apply to become a member of the Cyber National Mission Force. Hi, I'm Colonel Pete Hayden, and I'm excited to speak with you as a part of the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Conference. Whether you are in-person or virtual, your interest and participation are critical to solving some of the toughest and most important and interesting legal challenges facing our nation. Our commander, General Hawk, has set out his guiding priorities based on our competitive strengths, people, innovation, and partnerships. This conference will give us the opportunity to discuss exciting legal issues involving all of these priorities. But I want to reach out on something near and dear to all of our hearts here at Cyber Command. Our commander's very first priority is people. At every level, we want to attract and develop talented practitioners in diverse disciplines to the cyber enterprise, including legal professionals. Through participation in this week's events, you'll see exactly why that's so important to Cyber Command, to the services, and to the nation. The bottom line is this, we need you. Here's why we hope that you'll want to join our team. The Cyber Command Enterprise is one of the very few places in which military attorneys routinely work side by side with partners from across the executive branch. They also get the rare opportunity to partner with the best and brightest throughout the joint force to be a part of those high-functioning joint teams comprised of talented attorneys from across the services. Our council worked closely with the legislative office to help shape our congressional authorities, whether drafting a legislative proposal, identifying policy and legal implications of an authorization act, or assisting with congressional testimony preparation. Our office is deeply engaged with our legislative liaisons and our legislative overseers. Our judge advocates, civilian attorneys, and paraprofessionals work closely with the private sector and academia to develop collaborative mechanisms to advance national security interests and defend against malicious cyber activity. Finally, U.S. Cyber Command attorneys regularly interface with our international partners on everything from military exchanges, exercises, information sharing, to coordinating plans and operations, furthering our interoperability and deepening relationships with our strategic partners. Here at United States Cyber Command, we build relationships across the services, industry, research community, academia, and the whole of government. And we do it to facilitate innovation and foster collaborative sharing platforms to advance our national security interests and defend against malicious cyber activity. Our partnership philosophy, it's baked into our statutory mission to direct, synchronize, and coordinate military cyberspace planning and operations to defend national interests in collaboration with domestic and international partners. Our practice is diverse. If you're a legal professional interested in national security law, we offer you opportunities you won't find anywhere else. Through your legal advice, Cyber Command will be better postured to defend Department of Defense information networks, to generate insights and options in defense of the nation, 
and in support of other combatant commanders, and to ensure enduring mission advantage for the Department of Defense, the United States, and our allies and partners. If you're an administrative law or a criminal law practitioner, and you're listening in because you want to try something else, or you just find this work interesting, your analytic and advocacy skills are what we're looking for to solve emerging problems and make lasting change. If you're a contract or fiscal law wizard, please give us a call. National security law and acquisition law work hand in hand to enable our operators to spur innovation and maintain our technological